the way I look at it is that we've been taught to distract ourselves. Talk to us about sobriety. You obviously have your unfuck your life up phrase. Unfuck your life. And people used to say to me, so you don't drink, you don't do drugs. What do you do? And I'm like, live. It inflates your ego so much. You know, I don't want to cause anyone anxiety or depression because I've had it. And self acts of discipline are acts of self love. If the whole world is telling you to hate someone or disapprove of them, I have to question the whole world. It does seem to me like now the problem is our assessment of the issue than the actual issue. I also had given up sex at that point, which is another story entirely. But I thought if I can give these things up, I need to give up music just for a bit and I spent four months without playing any music. I spent so much time on my own. But, um, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I made up this That's going to be on the trailer there, by the way. Right? Hey everyone, and welcome to another podcast series brought to you by Babylonia Media, Combining and Colliding. Combining and Colliding derives from our headline motto for the company as a whole, Combining and Colliding Ideas. And for me as the founder, this is really what it's all about. Combining and Colliding Ideas, experiences, concepts and more to evolve our understanding of people and the world around us. Expect an organic conversation with every guest and hopefully some profound words of wisdom to take on board. This episode is with a lady called Nat Rich, a truly fantastic human being who has been through a hell of a lot. We go into her experiences with getting sober, her feelings towards social media and much more. I really hope you enjoy our first episode. Have fun. Um, all right, Combining Colliding podcast. Uh, with Nat Rich. Nat Rich is a personal respons- responsibility mentor, founder of I Am Sound Radio, a global wellness and dance radio station, is that right? Um, yeah. She's also a public speaker and founder of the Sustainable Flow, which is coming out next year. Yeah, that's a, a kind of project that's been on the side for a while that I've been working on, but it's, uh, it's a device that reduces carbon emissions. Cool, cool. So just to open us up, very, mm-hmm. very broad to start with, uh, what is happening, happiness to you? Oh, great question. Happiness. Do you know what? Waking up feeling cool and, and happy and chilled about my life, that's what I would define as happiness. It's not by someone else or, or having something. It's just waking up in the morning and feeling that I'm not going to die by breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not going to have an anxiety attack before 8 a.m. But no, yeah, just waking up and feeling good in myself. When do you think you discovered that? Oh, that, do you know what? That was actually a couple of years ago when I, I broke my back um, and I literally woke up one morning and I'd had um, two spinal fractures, two slip discs and a twisted pelvis and I wasn't really sure how it happened and um, which is another story in itself but I remember yeah. I, I, I lost, I basically had sciatica is what I had yeah. for a while and then I went to get an MRI, they told me I had a slip disc and then I woke up without being able to walk or do anything so I had to get rushed to hospital, flew back to London on Harley Street and the guy was like uh, you're not going anywhere back to Ibiza because I was living there at the time and he said You've got two slip discs, you know, a twisted pelvis and then, you know, an old and a new spinal fracture, one on either side of your spine. And I was, uh, yeah, sorry, making noises already. I'm trying to talk over here. Sorry. sorry, Yeah. My bad. (laughs) My bad. God, what a terrible host. I know. Um, so yeah, it was really quite hard for me and I was living in Ibiza and I had a dog and I had my radio show on Cafe Mambo and I'd had a whole project set up for the whole year and Mm. I lost everything. And I remember waking up when I was in um, in London. I'd moved back to the Fulham Road. And I woke up one morning thinking, now what? You know, there's nothing. I can't do anything. I can't walk. I can't do anything. And I laid there and I thought, do you know what? I don't actually have anything, but really, is anything that wrong? Mm. Other than the fact that I'm in a lot of pain. And I couldn't think of anything that was actually wrong that was going to kill me. And it just, it really just, the pressure just relaxed. And I just thought from this point on, and then the week after I got everything I needed, someone took over the flat, someone sorted the dog out, someone like with the radio show, everybody was fine about losing it. Nothing, even though everything had been taken away from me, nothing, you know, was that bad. And and I got everything I needed. And I even got an investor that week and I'd not even got up and I got everything. And I thought, you know what, the universe is looking out for me. I can relax. And I did. And it's been not saying I woke up every single day happy, (laughs) I'd say a good 90%. Yeah, that's that yeah. much. Yeah, literally. Because even if I've got a little thing, it might be an hour that it takes out of my day, but it's when I wake up, I'm just grateful to be alive. Like, I'm just thinking so it's you, not you much. you think it's almost like as soon as you simplify, you're, you're going to do better? Simplify. 
that is my friend of mine kept saying to me, God, simplify your life, simplify your life. He kept drilling it into my mind and uh, and it worked. And it, you know, I didn't expect to break my back in the process, but it works. It was exactly what I needed. Personal, personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. That's um, essentially what you've done off the back of the slip disc, breaking back, realising yeah. having that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. What You obviously have your unfuck your life up. Raised. Unfuck your life. Is yeah. it unfuck your life? Yeah, yeah, unfuck your life. Somebody else said that for me, and I, I used to do work. I still do, but not in person anymore. But uh, workshops called Unfuck Your Life, and it's a whole day where we get, you know, really look at everything that you said you were going to do, or you haven't yet done, or you need to do, and we get most of it done in a day. And mm. I, I did this with a friend, and then he um, labelled it that it was an Unfuck Your Life Day, and so then that kind of stuck. Are you still doing it? I do, yeah. I love them. I've got more one-on-one clients now, uh, and I've turned it into coaching. Um, so personal responsibility coach is, I made it up. Nobody has, I've never heard of one or never think, but I thought, I'm not a life coach. I'm, I'm here to get you to take responsibility. Yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking that. You hear about life coaches and success yeah. coaches, but I've never heard of yeah, personal responsibility. I made it up, and, and it's, it's funny because so, so many people are like, oh, my God, I actually need that. But for me, there's a difference between trauma and what happened to you when you were six building a business and actually just getting up and doing you like getting up and doing you and just doing your life Mm -hmm. is so important to you know respond to whatsapps to respond to emails to make sure you're having good communication looking after your finances making sure you're eating right all these things are where you can actually grow up and become an adult in these things and actually do them normally but we don't we avoid most of our life so why do you think people avoid it so much Uh, do you know what there's many reasons there's things that are really hard. We were never taught how to handle our emotions. We were never taught how to, you know, grow up and be humans. We were taught algebra or how to use a projector, sorry, a protractor. And I haven't used any of those skills, you know. And, and there's things, there's subjects at school that are irrelevant for what we need now. So we were never taught everything we needed when, you know, we grew up. And on top of that, the way I look at it is that we've been taught to distract ourselves. So if something gets a little bit hard, it's like have a drink or, you know, we've been plugged with drink, you know, drugs, partying. I mean, we've got some of the best DJs and the best music on the planet. So if it's available, we're going to go there. But if we combine it with the other things as well, you feel terrible for three days after having an an amazing eight hours. So we've sacrificed our own health and well-being for the sake of a good party, which is, you know, we were saying before, we've both done. And I don't regret that. Continuously, yeah. Yeah. And I used to work in the nightlife industry. And I don't regret that. But when I, you know, woke up, as we call it, um, I realised I'm thinking there's got to be something more to life. And there's so much more to life. And people used to say to me, so you don't drink, you don't do drugs. What do you do? And I'm like, live. Mm. Without that, I actually live. I think sobriety, not that I'm sober myself, but I think sobriety could almost be the best drug of them all. For me, I've got so good at reading my own feelings and understanding where I'm at I don't make it someone else's problem whereas I used to have a feeling and I'd be really uncomfortable and I might shout at someone or snap at someone or give somebody else grief because I didn't know how to handle my own stuff and now I can handle it um you know I'm a much better person to be around I used to be a nightmare and I was sarcastic so I was like quite funny and a nightmare so it would wind (laughs) you up even more and patronizing yeah exactly literally all of that and I didn't want to be here by the way I love sarcasm for the record I'm good good. I've bought some today in my bag Fantastic, fantastic. Um, you said you don't uh, regret anything nightlife-wise. Uh, so I do. Go on. I, I, I think I regret, like, get, when I smoked, really, really regret that. I think it's such an irresponsible thing to do. Mm-hmm. So things like that, I do regret. And, and I always struggle, well, not struggle, but it just intrigues me that some people can really just leave it behind so mm-hmm. intently, especially when, for me, like, I'm never going to be happy with myself the fact that I smoked on and off for a while because it's simply yeah. just so to me now that I'm so aware of health mm-hmm. it's just so irresponsible if I did it now I'd regret it because I, I know it's wrong but back then I didn't know the health I mean I was a younger when I was smoking but I didn't know the health implications to the extent that they are now and I think that's what happens with a lot of people it's only a certain amount of years and in information before you start to go this does well, what? Which you almost don't blame up. yourself because you just you think you're uh, because you can't, not like, you know, if you, really. you can't blame someone that hasn't got the right education. And this is why most people are out there trying to blame the world for their problems. It's like the world's not educated; it's you and your problems that matter, not the world's problems. Mm-hmm. So that's you know how it comes back to personal responsibility. Is I wasn't adulting, if you want to use that term. I was avoiding so much, and I remember making a commitment to myself and saying, "Do you know what? This week, 
I'm going to just face everything that shows up. And it was like the universe was like, oh, great, ready, and brought it all in. I had the most awkward conversations. I got horrible emails. Everybody just came out of the woodwork, and it was everywhere I turned was awkward. Mm. But by the end of the week, I'd smashed it, got through everything, was like almost a nervous wreck, but at the same time, like, oh, my God, realizing how much I wasn't doing that before. So I realized that I need to really work on this and not that you can step up to everything all at once. I would not advise anybody and call that in ever again because it was a hell week. But it made me realize how much I was avoiding and how much I was still being a child in so many areas of my life and blaming it on other people or the system or whatever. When you say being a child, what do you mean? Just like my, you know, the way I would deal with situations and like you'd either, you know, you gossip or you'd like dramatize. Like girls love drama. So, for example, if you no, know, no, they don't. No. But guys do as well sometimes. <laughs> never, never thought don't that. Don't want anybody to take that stereotypical. But in terms of like, you know, if I'd meet a guy, I would, and it wouldn't go right. I would tell all of my friends about this situation. Mm -hmm. And what that would do is it would keep it alive. So it might be over with that guy in a week and I might find another guy. But all my 12 friends that I've just told, I've now got 12 individual stories when I go and see them asking me about this other guy. So I've got to keep that energy alive and I've got to keep that drama alive because A, I was getting like little dopamine kicks off it. And I was going to say, it's, it's, it's the narcissistic side where you like yeah, the attention, right? I was so addicted to drama and attention. I didn't even know you could be addicted to drama and attention. And yeah. then I, I, I think, read I think about literally it. literally everyone is. Yeah, and I read about it and I'm like, what is in like addicted as in like drugs and alcohol addicted or just and then I'm thinking oh my god and it's the, the emotional response that it gives you is just the same so I looked and I was like I'm addicted you know I've been addicted to drugs I've been addicted to alcohol I've been addicted to social media and to attention and to drama and to work and I was just like you can be addicted to anything and it's the way you use it and what you use it for is whether it determines whether it's addictive or not. And for me, I just thought I didn't realize I was keeping the drama alive in that way. So when I changed it and I found it so hard, you know, people are like, oh, how did it go with that guy? And I'm like, yeah, okay. They're like, why? Some, something's got to happen. I'm like, no, cool. And I'm thinking, oh my God, every part of my body wants to tell you how much yeah, the dick yeah, he yeah. is and to, to keep this going. But actually, what did I do in that connection? What role did I play? And why am I dying to tell you something? So I'd watch my body's response dying to share. And having it's like when well, you're dying for chocolate and you're like, oh my God, I want chocolate. The same as like, I want to gossip. You get a kick out of gossiping. You do, you do. I, I notice that with guys as well. It's more a bit more like, you know, fuck to mate or whatever it is. Yeah. Whereas, and I was never really a kiss and tell sort of guy, but I found myself in certain environments or with friends being like, oh, like sort of going yeah. for it a bit. And it's like, oh, Mike, this, this is Because you for want you. that, it's a connection. Like when we gossip, it's a connection. And because you're the one that knows that information, people actually zone into you and you get intimate with someone. Mm -hmm. And it's that connection and that feel, feeling of importance and that feeling that you know something. And you can teach someone something. It inflates your ego so much. And we, you know, I did this so much. I was, you know, I knew everything for some hour. Everybody would always tell me things. and it, I, People would then come to me for information. And I'd reel it off feeling elated. And I'm thinking, that I need to not do that. And, I, and learning to shut up to actually shut up and, and not respond to everything was probably mm. the biggest thing that I ever did. Yes, it, it creates huge sort of personal gratification once you realise how, yeah. how much better that is. You know, um, I, I guess without, without, I don't mean this because I don't believe you, I just I just want to know because I, I find the whole like coaching world quite interesting. Mm -hmm. We actually, um, we had a, someone yesterday who was a success, success coach, as they call it. Mm -hmm. But what I would say, the first question I would ask is, would you even put yourself in the coaching world, number one? And number two, on sort of off the back of that, is what makes you the right person to mm -hmm. to give help people with responsibility? Yeah, good, really good question. So I've kind of, the idea of coach, I've all the words on my website actually say mentor mm -hmm. as opposed to coach. Um, but just because I'm kind of feeling into the word coach in itself, um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it because I know a lot of people who are coaching people that, shouldn't be coaching people because they're not well, doing something in their own life. It become a big thing and a lot, you do wonder, is yeah. this person really right to help it's me as a human because people want to help people. Mm -hmm. people. We've got this feeling that we want to help people and we also have another feeling where it makes us feel good when we help someone. So even coaching can become an addiction and it can help you help someone else rather than deal with your own stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's a natural path for lots of people to go into. It's not like a, you know, I'm not discrediting anyone in that sense. But I know for me personally that I've done the work 
and I, I and I'm not sitting here. Oh my God, look at me! But it's I have given up drinking. I've been around everyone I know and said no when everybody else is saying yes. Like mm-hmm. that takes you know a certain amount. I have given up drugs. I have given up social media, and I still do to this day. Mm-hmm. And that for me is something where I feel comfortable and I don't get pulls on those things. I don't it, not even tempted remotely to have an Instagram page or to have a glass of wine with a steak or anything. Mm. And when it comes to gossiping and stuff, I'm still very, you know, I like having good conversations and knowing about things, but sharing other people's information is a rude thing to do. But before yeah, I would just, yeah. you know, run off at the mouth. Now I'm like, oh, that's sacred. I need to keep that. And I feel it in a different way. And that for me is because I've done the work and I've, I've helped my friends and, and other people, not even my friends, that have always come to me and said, oh, how do I do this? Or what do I do this? And everyone's like, you should be a coach. You should do this. And for ages, I didn't want to identify with that because I thought, what makes me that? I haven't got the skills yeah, or, yeah, the, yeah. or the training, but it's my life has been the training. It's like some friend said to me, oh, you've got QBE. It's qualified by experience. Mm-hmm. If you name a disaster of some kind in a social way, I've been through it, if not more than once. And I've got all this information of how I've handled things. I can now teach other people that in the aid of helping them to stop going through you know their own hell and if it helps then I will but for a long time I didn't want to step up to that plate because I didn't feel like a success in any way and I didn't feel truly happy but when my back situation no happened, bit of imposter syndrome almost yeah but when my back happened and I managed to you know I was happy but I couldn't walk I was happy and I was skinny mm. I was happy and I was single and mm-hmm. I'm you know and I'm still happy to this day even though those things happened to me and everyone was like oh I can't believe how you're handling this mentally you know, you're all right. And people talk about lockdown, how it's horrible. I spent six months in bed on my own when the whole world was out doing their stuff. I Mm -hmm. couldn't get out, you know, try doing that on your mental health on your own. And I blitzed it and I became a better version of myself because of it. So I knew that, you know, it helped me. And this is why I think, you know, not that I think lockdown is a good thing. I don't even want to go there. But in terms of what can be achieved when you sit with yourself and go through your own feelings, is you know magnificent it's magic you don't really need anyone else you can figure it all out by yourself and that's what I was doing and I I don't have mentors and coaches as such in my life I don't pay a therapist and there's nothing wrong with that if you want to but I know how much I've grown by asking myself the questions and going through and journaling and and making sure that I sit in the mirror and I look at myself and I'm happy with myself and I just done all of that and I know it's possible so I just want to help you I don't think everybody needs a therapist I don't think everybody needs a coach or a mentor you if you coach with me you won't be coaching with me for the next two years mm-hmm. because if I if I'm having to do that I haven't done my job properly but you know you've got skills I'm not going to insult someone and say you can't do it on your own because you can I can just teach you how to handle all the crap stuff 10 weeks and we're done if you want accountability it's every couple of weeks whatever but it's not something where I need to hold your hand because I feel that I'm the one that can heal you yeah I mean I think it's like it's quite it's always quite hard to quantify what qualifies someone to be a coach or mentor someone I definitely think without a doubt there's a visceral element to it in the sense if that person feels really drawn to you or whatever mm-hmm. it's, it, it's great it's just, it's just interesting to see if it's obviously doing a world of good for a ton of different people especially like you know when you talk about responsibility like did you, did you go with responsibility coach because you feel once you take responsibility and get order, that's always the platform for everything else? Is that generally what you find? Yeah, because you can show up to yourself in every moment. You can take responsibility for the life and the situations that you fundamentally create or that you know happen to you. If you've got that responsibility for every part of your life, whatever challenges come your way, allow you to handle them. It might not be easy, but you can take responsibility and not go, oh my God, it's their fault, it's that person's fault. Because the world works in mysterious ways. And if you need some kind of lesson or you need some kind of challenge to make you grow, then it's going to come. And if you don't like what comes, we resist it. And if you're resisting life, which naturally flows to you, it might be uncomfortable, but if you resist it, then what happens is that you have this feeling of, anger and guilt or shame or regret or confusion or frustration or rejection whatever it is that's where the anxiety and depression comes from i think it's severe for me personally and i've seen it more with other people it's like severe like dissatisfaction within and, and it's always based on that that's why i find responsibility an interesting word for what you're talking about because for me it's it's order and, and 
responsibility and making the right, like right, the right decisions is, is yeah. what I keep emphasizing. Mm -hmm. Even so much so, literally the other day, I, I had like I felt really uplifted with energy because I was like, okay, I'm making a lot of the right decisions consistently mm -hmm. as well. And that was like that was that for me was such an interesting feeling to have for ages. And what's interesting about that as well is then you like I had a smirk on my face. I'm like, should I have a smirk on my face? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. is this all right to be sort of happy about this? Yeah. And and it's just interesting. Like the next layer to that, I guess, is interesting. People are quite surprised when they feel happy with themselves. Yeah. And that's a whole other almost battle you've got to go through. Yeah. Oh, can I keep? Can I keep doing this? Yeah. It develops trust when you've got person when you've got responsibility in the things that you do in your life or the things that you have around you. You're developing trust in your decisions. And if you continuously make decisions that help you get to where you want to be, you, you trust yourself more. And it's discipline, self acts of discipline are acts of self love. And you're constantly choosing the right thing for you in the day because in the future, when you look back, you're like, I'm so glad I chose that path rather than the other one. And you're learning to love yourself by being disciplined. And people say, oh, you know, discipline's boring or it's hard or whatever. I'm not saying it's easy, but like I've made it as fun as possible. I use Lego and colors and make it quite humorous with people. But I come from an extremely disciplined background in the sense that my parents were military. And like even on the way here, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm coming, I'm just running a bit late and I'm having to check in yeah, with you yeah. because I know that it's not just me that this might affect. It might be you. I don't know the setup. You might have booked this room for an hour and I might be costing you an extra whatever. I don't know your financial situation. There's all these things that come into that that might we're good, actually we've got be good. <laughs> But there's all these things that before I wouldn't have cared. I'd just been, oh, sorry, I'm late. Yeah. And I actually now think what was the actions of what I'm doing, I know I couldn't do anything differently this morning, but the situation might cause you some frustration. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking responsibility in a whole way of, of allowing you to know where I'm at. You might have needed to cancel me or whatever. I just think a little bit greater than I used to because it's mm -hmm. not all about me anymore. Mm -hmm. Although I used to love it when it was because it was much easier. <laughs> but now it's definitely, you know, my look on things and how I want to help other people. I know what boundaries are. And some people have firm boundaries because they've been hurt in the past. It's not because they're being horrible. And if I push those boundaries, we all know what that feels like. If somebody's pushed on your boundaries, you're like, oh, my God, this is really, you know, grating on me. It's getting annoying. And that can really affect someone's entire day. Yeah, yeah. so true. So for so me, it's, you know, I don't want to cause anyone anxiety or depression because I've had it. And, and I got through and I had a breakdown and it was hell. But I don't want to do that to anyone else. So by me taking personal responsibility, I might not get it right all the time because I'm, I'm not aware of everyone's boundaries. But if I try and not to piss someone off or try and not to be late or try and take responsibility for what I can, then hopefully that you'll see my intention and it'll be better for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it made, it made, made me think, actually. Do you think, and I've, I found this more on a personal level, but do you think once you realise, and this is something I am actually really trying to push within the whole, like, Babylonian media concept with regards to philosophies and the way we approach any podcast we do. Do you, do you think as soon as you start to realise that, well, this is my belief anyway, that humans are quite, we've got a lot of commonalities, mm -hmm. but there's definitely, it's, it's all about that environmental factors that make that person who they are in general, is, mm -hmm. as far as day to day and, and those things. Really, as soon as you understand that, you become less judging of that person. And well, I guess yourself first, because you understand, mm -hmm. and secondly, of, of everyone else, you're much more like you said, consider it, like you said, when you're messaging me, all these little yeah. things, but it's the, I guess it's the meticulous attention to detail and small variables that, that contribute to who you are yeah. and people. And no, people notice the small things, you know, when they say in relationships, or you notice little things, you know, girls notice the little things that guys do and it shows that, that you know, there's the tension there. Attention to detail is not just for relationships or legal agreements, it's for life. And like, for example, yeah. I went yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to my friend's house the other week and I went to the toilet, literally had a wee and then I noticed that there's no toilet roll left. There's like three things. So I used that and then I put another one on mm. and then went and it's sat funny, and had it, tea. It does sound so sort of... Yeah, it's minor. minor but, it, but it does make a difference. Yeah, and I didn't think anything of that. I don't, I don't think attention detail that. should even be a phrase. No, I think should just be it's what just, it is. should That's be who you are. Be. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. we have to point them out right now. But mm. he, I never even thought in a million years he would say anything about that. So I just put the toilet, on, you know, the toilet roll on and went and sat down. And he's just like, oh, you put a new toilet roll because he lives on his own. Yeah. He's like, you put a new toilet roll you're, on. You're considerate. Yeah, yeah, I was like, yeah. yeah. And he went, it says a lot about someone. I'm like, does it? And then I'm like, do you know what it does? I really think it does. It means it means you're not. I just don't I, want to be the next person on the toilet. It's like, yeah. <laughs> oh no. Empathy. It's literally yeah. empathy in the smallest form. It's tiny, but it, you know, it's just so, for me, it's so important that I can 
show up the best version of myself but i used to f- i used to have an addiction to personal development as well ironically yeah, yeah. but this isn't this isn't something that can be negative if you're constantly trying to be a better person in some way whether it's a coffee or whether it's a toilet roll whatever it is that's a good thing but we also need to appreciate that we're not perfect and we're not going to get everything right all the time and we've got to kind of be a little bit relax but it's, we're not doing that i'm not putting that toilet roll in his house so he approves of who i am because that's a different version like if yeah, i'm doing yeah. it just because i want him to see it and want him to think yeah, i'm not, a good person the tap on the back. yeah if i'm doing it for you know that tap on the back then that's me coming from my ego needing some form of attention and wanting you know connection with him and so i'm sticking a new toilet roll on it, like that doesn't help if i'm just doing it because i know that that's what you do with a toilet roll. You know, it's like you put the lid back on the toothpaste because that's where the lid goes. You put more loo roll on the toilet things. That's where it goes. It's funny the analogy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true. It it's true. It's it, tiny. It, the simplicity of it does relate into, yeah. into so many different things. But I didn't do it because I want him to come out of the bathroom and be like, hey, you're a good person. It's just it's not what I do it for. But it's recognising the difference as well because trying to be good for other people you end up walking around on your tiptoes. Mm. And I call them CCs. They're like constant correctors. Mm. And it's not bad to constantly check yourself and keep moving. But if you're constantly checking yourself to a point where you can't really be free or you're constantly checking other people and pulling them up on it, that's when it becomes a problem. And the world is full of CCs running around. It's, it's constant correctors everywhere in this environment. Um, Such as? In terms of like what's going on, you know, in the way that we, the words that we can use, the way that we speak, every, you know, cancel culture is excessively, you know, it's just bigger than I think anybody thought it would ever be. Yeah, we didn't even it, know what cancel it's, culture it's was until 2020. It's it is. And it's, it's a need to control your environment rather than the need to control yourself. So lots of people are trying to control the environment because they don't have a handle on who they are. And, and control people's thoughts, which yeah. is what really concerns me. Like, it's, it's impossible to control your own thoughts all the time. So trying to control someone else's thoughts instead of your own is even harder yeah. it's like a, it's an impossible thing to do i get that there's a need for us to grow in terms of our communication i get there's a need for us to recognize our differences and actually do it in a peaceful way i get that there's a difference of people how they now want to be you know identified people want to be seen and oh, i get it and i understand it and i understand all the differences that you could talk about what i don't understand is why it's got the way it has got but actually, I kind of do understand why it's gone. I was going to say, do, why, why do you think it's gone away on the way it's gone? So I think we've suffering from something that I've made up. I, I make a lot of things up because I spend so much time on my own. But <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, <laughs> I've made up this. Term, That's going to be on the trailer, that by the way. Right? I make a lot of things up because I spend time on my own. Time on my own, but I, I have a lot of original thought. Let's say that, um, and I came up with something called CRD and CRD CRD and CRD, and no. CRD is context replacement disorder. Mm-hmm. And what I think we're suffering from on a global scale is CRD, this context replacement disorder from the media. So they will tell a story, but they will twist it and take it out of context so it causes a reaction in you. And you go away with that headline thinking that's how the world is. And off you go into your life programmed with this headline maybe six or seven times on different news outlets. And you live your life and you think that that's in your echo chamber. You think that's how the world is. Mm -hmm. So if you add CRD, so if you add this context being replaced, you know, every 24 hours, because it does... Then you go on to social media and you look at Facebook and you look at the fact that these algorithms are designed. I don't know if you saw Social Dilemma, but I'm sure you Yeah, did. everyone keeps referring to that. Yeah, yeah and the Although algorithm- I feel like a lot of people were recognising this before it even came out. Yeah, I think they were, but I feel like now, I think it was great and there's a lot of information in there, but there's also a lot of staged information in there, yeah. um, which has its own agenda. Um, but I don't discredit what they're doing, so I think it's important. And I'm, you know, I've signed up on their email and I want to know more information about what they do, but... It's, you know, we have this algorithm that is designed to keep you online. So what it's doing is it's selling your time. So I used to think, because I'm not on social media anymore, but I used to think, okay, I'm on social media, but if I don't click on the ad, I'm not paying any advertisers and I'm not giving them any money, it's not my problem. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that they were feeding me information relative to what I'd searched for before to keep me on there. So it keeps my time on there and then they sell my time. They don't care if I click on an advert because Mm -hmm. they sell it to the advertisers. So they make money regardless. So the one thing we can't get back is time. And these guys are selling it as well as context replacement disorder, as well as the fact that they want you to hate someone, which is happening at the moment. And I'm not here to discuss Trump and I bring it up quite a lot in different ways. But 
if the whole world is telling you to hate someone or disapprove of them, I have to question the whole world. Because sure. if I've never met this person on the other side of the planet, and I don't know who he is, and I'm only seeing snippets of information, if I went to a court of law and they said, oh, do you know this man? I'd be like, technically, you could pull me up and say, not at all. Mm. I think I do, mm. but I don't. And everything's being twisted around all these different leaders around the world. I don't know anybody that's met any of these leaders. And I know people that hate them. Mm. I'm like, do you know what that's energetic? Yeah, it's so doing? emotionally driven now. People's yeah. decision on people's sort of analysis of these situations. Not, not that I'm, some I'm not pro Trump in any, any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's a few policies out there. If you take him away, yeah. you probably go, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Or economically, that that might make sense. But people are so distorted in their view because because of the emotion and the fact that, like you said, the narratives are so, so so sort of intensely overzealous. Mm -hmm. It really, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that. It's like what I was saying before about considering the variables within a person, it's the same thing on this level. Like we've really got to try and really have a bigger in, intent, like sort of intention to really lay, lay the full picture, picture out there and not agendize it or anything, which is again what we're trying to do at Babylonia. In fact, we were talking about this other day, but I'm obsessed with the fact that we've become so polarised, I think, mm -hmm. and I think it's like pretty much based on exactly what you said. I think it's completely a narrative that's put out there. Yeah. So much so that we will do a documentary basically trying to highlight that we're not that polarised within, mm -hmm. within Britain because obviously you've got your Brexits and, and, and COVID and so on and so forth. But it does seem to me like now the problem is our assessment of the issue than the actual issue. Mm -hmm. That would be the best way I'd put it. You know, like we're getting much more separated as a, as a society, as, yeah. as a set, set of human beings by the analysis of the problem than the actual problem. It, totally. And, and like I look at it and I think to myself, and this is why I call my YouTube channel Being Human. Being human, what actually does that mean? So it's before you've got your name, before you've got your gender, before you've got your race, before you've got your religion or your political differences, before you know anything, you were born as a human being. And we, you know, that's naturally, we ha humans have their own natural way of living, their own common law as it is. And that's been forgotten. And I'm just about to do a course, actually, from the Sovereign's Way, um, sovereignsway.co.uk, I think it was, .com. And um, it's teaching us the original rights that we have as human beings, which I think is fundamentally important. And when people say to me, oh, you know, I had a lineup of events that I've got going on in January, and somebody said to me, oh, the information you've got there, there's no LGBTQ stuff on there. And I'm like, it's about being human. And they're like, well, were you saying that's not human? I'm like, no. I'm not. I'm saying that's a part of what happens when you get an identity. Before you get your identity, you're human. So I'm going here about your feelings you're going and your super, emotions. Super ground level right source, ground, yeah, yeah. Before you worry about the exactly. Rest. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying that those subjects might not come on board. And we have got one show that's around that, but he didn't feel there was enough content there. And I'm like, somebody else's opinion of how I've programmed my content for my own platform mm. for my purpose, which is to help people with their mental health problems. Mm has a judgment on me on whether I've provided enough content to meet their needs and what they want to see. So we're coming at it from two different angles. Now we could meet together and say, hey, do you know what? You might be right. Maybe I need to make more content. But without actually asking me what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, just assuming that I need to have more well, stuff that on there. Thing, isn't it? Exactly. And one, it's one, the assumption. One opinion you have means you must be this awful person. Exactly. And it's the assumption. And it, lucky for me, they know me and they know that I'm not eliminating this stuff because I've got some kind of you know black problem like mm. I haven't in that sense and I haven't in any sense to do with that stuff but I don't feel that that's what we need to talk about right now in this area mm. everybody else is talking about that I've had conversations on the radio about that I constantly get interviewed about that and I'm happy to talk about that but mm. in this scenario we're going deeper and that's no disrespect to the deep conversations that are happening but I'm talking about baseline human being what you were born as a human being unless you're born as an alien and if you are let me know who you are because i would love to have a <laughs> love conversation to meet you. right podcast ready <laughs> um you can join me on that one i'd love to but the you know there's so many things that actually matter like your feelings and your emotions and how to handle your moods and and how to just exist before you go hi my name's john i'm black six foot two and i'm gay mm. like all of those things are an extension and they're part of your identity and they're important to you but there's a part of you that is important to the world and that's how do you operate as a human being with other human beings because mm. it's your differences that we've got the problem when you assess that it goes back to the commonality aspect you actually mm. realize you've got more in common with someone you just wouldn't yeah. at all and, and i feel like i've 
in the nicest, you know, for me, I didn't realize this, but when Black Lives Matter happened, I questioned myself on, you know, how many black friends have I got? How many, you know, and I'd never asked myself that yeah. question. 80%, I think a lot of people did, yeah. 80 percent of my friendship circle is of another um you know ethnicity in some way i had no idea because they're just my mates yeah and that's not me as a white person saying i don't see color i'm just saying they're my mates and i've never had to ask myself that question so yeah. i learn by learning that you know looking at it but the year before i'd read Carla's book which is natives and i think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. fascinating I've, I've watched quite a few of his yeah his, and i mean he's, he's super he's, he's super incredible. what we're talking about i mean he's He's, I'd say he is quite a lefty in some ways, mm -hmm. but I think socially and the way he analyzes things is very, very well rounded. Yeah. Like he, when he compared the, there's a point he compared between sort of the Glasgow knife, uh, knife crime issue and here, and he's saying it's not a race issue at all, really. It's economic depression, yeah. and it's usually to do with certain young men. And yeah. before, and like, like you said, it's going back to that primary stage before you worry about the, they matter, but it's that's the that's a consequential effect, uh, mm -hmm. consequential circumstance. But you really got to worry yeah. about the primary factor. And this brings me back to where Facebook sells your time. He spent time looking at this stuff and educating mm. himself, which is the key. If you're on TikTok or if you're on Instagram, it's everything's quick. You you might spend eight hours on there, but it's quick bits of information, and you don't get the full story when it's taken out of context, and you don't see the full picture. Someone like him has gone out and educa educated himself and spent time looking at these subjects, so now he can seem like a grand wizard of information, where really he's got the same human capacity as most people, mm. but they don't spend their time in the same way. Yeah, and they Effective spend it. Time is just I mean reading. exactly. I and think so people, when people need to read so much. There's so many fascinating. I never used to read when I was younger, and then I started reading like self help books, and obviously it was all about me. And at the time, I was addicted to myself, and I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, I can read about myself, but I was learning. I never argued with an author, but um, they're telling me off in these books, and I'm thinking, oh my god, that's me, that's me, that's me. I don't want to be this person that they're describing. So I started reading more and changing what I could about myself, so I could, you know, have a better life. And I learned that because I was reading about it. And then my reading, you know, pile kind of got bigger and I started reading about other things. But someone like Akala is perfect for the time that we're living in right now. And I think he's fascinating because he does have so much information and he's educated enough and he's entertaining enough to inspire other people to take the same journey. Whereas that didn't happen quite a lot in the past. I don't feel that people are as entertaining and as intellectually, you know, developed as he is. And he's got that kind of like, you know, growing up in Camden, that whole situation. People can relate to that. And there's relatables. Mm. And I value someone like him. And I would call him an influencer because he's influencing someone to spend their time in a better way. But if you're an influencer on Instagram or on TikTok or something, but you've got no real substance or you've got nothing to offer and you're not educating people to spend their time in a better way, then for me, you're not an influencer. You're, take, you're as bad as Facebook. You're taking someone's time away from them. And well, you that's have to the think right about sort that. of influencer. Yeah. You said, yeah, it's yeah, and it's this influencer world that we have. Some of them help and inspire other people because they're doing makeup tutorials. And some people will go, oh my God, makeup tutorials. Do you know, like for women to be able to learn to do their makeup properly and to make themselves feel better, you know, for them, that's a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. They can ex actually wake up in the morning and exist in their day because they know how to do their makeup and they feel better about it. But you'll get somebody that's edu uneducated slagging off the makeup influencer. I mean, I don't think we need 155 million of By them. By the way, when you say uneducated, you mean educated in the sense of actually taking the time to take a well rounded view on a particular subject as opposed to the conventional education of they've gone to a, school, exactly. a, a particular school or university education. Yeah, and I feel like we can only really educate ourselves on things that we're interested in. And if you're not interested in it, then you're not going to be educated in it because you're not going to want to mm -hmm. go that route. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, but there's going to be something else that you're really interested in that you can become educated by. So for what I think about education is when we go education on oh, the school system, that's not interesting to me, mm -hmm. but I am highly educated in other areas and I can have really great conversations with people because I've become educated in those areas. But for someone else to feel like they're less than or not as informed of me, it's just that comparison thing that, that we've got at the moment, which is not real. It's just that, you know, you might know something about hammers and, and drilling and you might be the best in your area. I can't compete with that. I've got no interest in it and I don't want to. But you are an expert in that, in, as of what you might say. The only thing I feel that we can really be experts in is ourselves. And, you know, if you can become good at understanding yourself and being an expert on yourself, then great, because that's the only kind of goal that there is. I also think that gives you the best chance of and being an expert in something else in the yeah. long run, because yeah. you understand what you like, you understand what, exactly. what you care about, and that puts you in the right direction with yeah. regards to what you expose yourself to. How, with all those sort of points in mind, how important do you think relatable content is? 
In what sense? What in the sense you? of, I think that's the source of anything that would really interest you. It exposes mm-hmm. you to something. Uh, you, you see the personability of even you talking now, someone will relate to that. And then yeah. as a result, we go, okay, so I'm interested in it. Oh, she's a responsibility coach. That's interesting. Yeah. And I always think that's the source of everything. Do you, do, I guess I would ask, do you agree with that? And, um, could you expand on it? Yeah, all? if it's done in a natural sense. So if I'm giving you a book rec- recommendation from based on what I've said, and you're like, oh, yeah, I love that. I'm going to go buy it. It's fine. But if it's online and you're just being fed related content from everything that you just looked at in the last day, that can be very confusing. That can be overwhelming. And it's and it can take people down a path of like, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what to do. But is so that, is that the only route? Because it's interesting you say that because I'd give the example literally with the reason why I'm even doing Babylonian, like the source of how it all started. Mm-hmm. I was pushed towards podcasts like your Rogans and stuff of that nature. But maybe luckily because, dare I say, I was more sort of, level-headed i took Mm -hmm. the right bits out of it and then i was exposed to things that that really i really found interesting and as a result i got onto stuff like simon sinek and 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 you find your why and all all these points i I remember literally like the real moment i realized i wanted to do this or do something that was actually useful and media media bound was when i listened to simon sinek talk about the fact like recognize what your skills are find out what you care about Mm -hmm. find out something useful what's useful to people so i would argue in that this is why i'm I don't think there's one route, and I think it, to some extent what, what we will try and do at ba- Babylonia is the reason why we'll have such an array of topics is because if you just come across me once mm-hmm. by the algorithm, yeah. in the end you might be fed loads of other things. So I think there's yeah. there's a bit more to that, I think, sometimes than just a straight route of like you're going to be fed the same crap over and over, mm-hmm. and over again. I think the issue would be is, yeah, is a lot of it lack an intellectual capacity that, mm-hmm. that can make you dumber almost. Have you ever been to a restaurant where they've offered you so much on the menu that you can't make your mind up? Yeah. yeah. How does that feel when you're like, oh. um, I just got a lot of different stuff, but that's probably not the answer you're going for. <laughs> no, but in the sense that you feel overwhelmed and you're like, oh, God, this is a lot. We, you don't know where to start. You don't know where to start. We are in an age of information, like beyond anything we've ever experienced before. There is so much information out there. And when you're given this entire plethora of information and you think, wow, okay, this is a lot. You can get overwhelmed, which makes you go, oh, I'm just going to go on Instagram for a bit. It's easier. Just in that moment, it's those points. Zone. Yeah, it's those points that keep us. They actually direct us back to our habits. And if it means going for a fag because it's easier or having a drink because it's easier, mm. we are overwhelmed by information. This is something that I experience in myself, and I'm not saying it's the same for everyone, but I, I term it in the sense of going to a restaurant and, and seeing all this stuff on the menu where I'm like, I want to eat everything. Do you know how interesting it looks right now in the world? Like, if you've only, like, I'm so grateful that I started learning about myself and the world and I kind of woke up spiritually, if you want to call it that, in 2009. Because if I, like, my world went upside down, inside down, and I had a breakdown, Mm. and the world was back then. Imagine waking up today that the world's not quite what you thought it was, and all of a sudden, the world's actually screaming back to you that something's not right because back then it was like oh there is something to question about 9 11 or there is something to question about that and oh i am interested in that and maybe so you've got this little search for truth and truth and personal development and conspiracies and whatever it is can be addictive because you you feel like you're on this journey of discovering you're like you know in scooby-doo they're all looking for like you know the bad guy and they go on this adventure and it can be addictive because it's more interesting than your real life but doing that in 2020 it must be the hardest thing for your mental health because you're questioning your mental health, you're questioning your job because you might not have it or you don't know if you want to do it anymore. Like you were saying, you were not sure if you want to be in this industry and you, where do you want to go, whether you're on furlough mm-hmm. or not. Then you're questioning your relationships and your family and spending time with your family, which is difficult for some. Are you in the right relationship? Oh, what's going on in my life? Am I with the right friends? Should I maybe be drinking every night of this? I probably shouldn't be drinking every night of lockdown. Oh, when was the last time I didn't do coke? All right, okay, yeah. And then once you get outside of your own world, look up and every single media angle out there is pointing in various directions of the most epic proportion of bullshit we've ever seen. And completely agendized every time. Completely changing the CRD coming back in, the context replacement disorder. And then... Not only that, you've got social media. So you've got all of that in your own life and you're questioning everything and the world seems like it's going to shit and then you go online and you're literally seeing everyone's filtered bullshit. Do you, do you, do you hate social media? Hate's a strong word. I don't want to use it. I don't like what it's done to the world, knowingly what it's done to the world because a lot of people know or knew where this was going and they still work in it knowing how bad it is. Mm-hmm. 
I feel the use of, you know, is it Facebook that's the problem? Or is it the people that run Facebook that have set it up in a way that's a problem? Is it Facebook that's a problem? Or is it the people who are using it that's the problem? You know, it, it, we can't just sweep everything under one term, which is very clear these days in 2020. Yeah. Um, sweeping statements are not allowed in 2021. Um, but it's so hard to say, you know, for me, my life's got better. And I mean, like, fundamentally in ways I never imagined since I came off social media. And I earn more, I sleep better, I have better friendships, I've had more press, I've done more stuff with my work. Everything I'm doing is now more concentrated in a way where I wake up and I'm happy every day. Because I came off social media and I realised that, yeah, no drugs, no alcohol, no social media, yeah, I'm still living, I'm still able to live. And and I love my life. So now I don't have any social media for my businesses either. And people mm. are like, how are you going to do that? And I'm like, how they Yeah, I was it? surprised when you told me that. Yeah. I really was, apart from LinkedIn, obviously, but... But it's, you know, for me... And you wouldn't call YouTube social media, by the way. I know, so... I, I, I don't as well. I don't I think call YouTube social media. Yeah, it's educational, but also I'm not posting my dinner all there or sharing anybody else. I'm not chatting to people on there. So for mm. me, it's not social. It's You're also a, doing it to completely represent... Uh, sorry, show the fact that, yeah. you know, life is not as, as pretty as Instagram. Or exactly. Anything. And, you know, for me, the way I thought about it, I understand things are energy everything is made of energy and we won't go too far into that um but in the sense of mm. it's a scientifically proven fact that everything's made of energy and we pull things into us that we resonate with that we vibe with and i thought if i'm doing the right thing and i'm vibing with it and it, it's making me happy it will make other people happy who align with me and it might take me a little bit longer to go and find those people or to get those people but naturally physically you know from a physics perspective i'll be drawing those people to me and I only want to be surrounded by the people that I really resonate with because no one wants to be in a room full of people they don't like, although that's going to be highly educational at times but <laughs> and funny. Um, but it's something that I felt like I want to build a life where I resonate with people and I can share ideas and stuff. I don't want to build a life with loads of people that aren't interested in doing that. Sure. So not everyone is my, you know, my audience. And everyone that I've spoken to, like Pioneer, um, DJ equipment and stuff, they came on board. And I, I know Mark, the owner, and I was saying about what I was doing. And they were like, yeah, we'll, we'll do some advertising with you. When you say came on board... In, in came what? on board with the radio station, sorry. He said, I, yeah, we'll I do Am Sound, yeah. Yeah, for I Am Sound. And he said, we'll do some advertising with you because I really like what you stand for and I like the fact that you're not using social media. Mm. Now, other people in my life are like, you need to be... To get any sponsors or to get anything of what you're doing, you need to be on social media. That's where you need to exist. First person coming on board with me because I'm not going on social media. Yep. And that I love because, you know, it's a great brand. I want to align with them and they want to align with me. And that's where you find your happiness when you, you don't date people you don't like. You know, you don't go to business with people you don't like. So if I'm doing it naturally, for me, it makes me feel better. And it means I might have to work a little bit harder. I might have to be a little bit more creative with the brand. But that challenges me. I grow from doing that. Otherwise, I'm just like, oh, hey. Sorry, I shouldn't put it on the table. Facebook post. <laughs> so I got told off for shutting the table. But Facebook post out there to the world. Yes, you know, somebody put something on, um, oh, where was it the other day? Saw it. Somebody said, does your net work? And I thought it's quite interesting. And you chuck your net out there and you chuck your content out there and you put it out there and you're like, what are you drawing back? Is that working for you? And I thought about it in a sense, I'm not putting anything out there in terms of like chucking it all on social media. Is my net really working for me? Am I keeping in contact with the people I know and love? Am I making an impression on the people? Am I being a nice person where they go, I actually want to do business with you? You know, I've got to grow and be a nice person to get somebody to, you know, to want to hang around with me, let alone invest in me or put money in me. It keeps you on your toes when you actually have to physically be a better person and a nice person. Because the world's full of keyboard warriors yeah, out agreed. there. And, and I see stuff, you know, I used to see stuff online like okay and just scroll on by I, I don't understand why we have to stop and and then go it's you wouldn't do that to 90 percent of the people that you see in the street yeah. you wouldn't have half the conversations but i can control myself and go well that's a bit of a weird comment scroll on by and i don't oh. even think about it again mm. but if i engaged in that that becomes could become the next three days of my life i'm not giving my time away mm. like that for anyone i don't know mm. and if there's a comment i don't like you welcome to have that comment i don't need to keep it yeah. And that's for me, you know, not having social media and running a business without it. I've got more time to think, 
my team are really creative. I've got some great people working with me at the moment. You, you think it's over consuming, and you think you, you per so, yeah. so when I said, do you hate it? You're not. You don't hate it, but for you personally, it really doesn't work. And you think I don't you think know. it works for most people. I just think we're accustomed to now having to need it. We're being told we need it. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I kind of ask that question is because for me, again, sort of banging on the whole Babylonian drum is. It's going to be there regardless, and I found it quite useful in some ways. I, I recognise mm -hmm. the problems of it, but I found it useful in some ways. And if we can make, make you sort of outweigh the the, the crap, so to speak, mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do, and actually use it for the right ways, as much as in very sort of simple terms, I'm sure some young guys will go on Instagram and see really hot girls and think, "Well, I need to go and work out and sort myself <laughs> out, or I'm never going to be able to get that." Mm -hmm. That for me, I don't really have a problem. That's with that. not bad. I don't have a problem <laughs> with that. But it's about getting people to understand how to use it the right way, be quite limited with it and quite mm. disciplined. That, that, that's, that's really important to me because I do think there's elements of seeing the outer world alongside the fact that the, pa the power and the speed of information is so good that some, the, I guess the irony of social media in particular or social media or the internet as a whole is it has two amazing, it has one, it's a double-edged sword because the power and the speed of information is so fast mm -hmm. that it can be unfiltered and you can get to some truth, mm -hmm. which is why I think elements of, different types of media have grown quite fast, but at the same time, there's a whole other side where it can just be completely, sp it can be a big complete spin-off or, or just a, so it's, it's got a real, real veil to it that mm -hmm. it ends up, the, the trick, the real issue right now is figuring out what the truth is and what is really useful to people. So mm -hmm. this is why I think, I do see problems with it, but I do, I do see an upside. I just, I just don't think the upside is big enough yet. Do you, so I'm working on a project at the moment with a guy who has a solution to all of the bad stuff we have on social media. Is and it regulation of some sort? Uh, no, um, it's a completely different platform. Um, he's speaking to some of the biggest football clubs in the world right now sure. to help them bring their network back into their ownership. Sure. Um, because at the moment, some of the biggest football clubs in the world have all of their fans online, but when it comes to having their own... Um, you know, their own fans in their own app or whatever, they've got very little, um, you know, support and very little kind of dedication. Their fans are existing on these big tech platforms. And he has a solution to that on where they can actually own their fan base. Mm. And it's, you look at things like OnlyFans, a few of these other places. OnlyFans I find incredibly concerning. It's, Yes, it is, but it's it's been developed. Like it's so it's been developed out of a need for the influencer wanting to control their content in such a way, mm -hmm. and I get it. I think it is. It can be quite disturbing, um, but there are ways if you change the system slightly to exist on social media or to exist in media and to have a brand and to build up your fan base in other ways. The bit that makes it social is where everyone is, oh my God, we've got all this connection, we've connected to all of our friends, that's great. Be connected to your friends in real life. Have real friends. Yeah. Have brands Call online. Me. meet me in person. Yeah, have brands online. Exist as a brand online. Do that stuff online. But when it comes to your social stuff, make that personal, make that human. Mm -hmm. Because at the minute, you know, if I haven't seen someone, I guess if I had social media and I've not seen one for three, sorry, it's not seen someone for three years, that's another positive, right? Yeah. I think. Like. You, can, you can see someone, you're like, oh my God, I haven't seen that person in ages. It's great. But there's two things. So one, I went to Ibiza, which I told you about a few weeks ago. And I went to somewhere called The Hub in Ibiza, which I used to work at and I loved. And um, I saw loads of people I've not seen for ages. And mm. I had this genuine, amazing connection with them. Like, oh my God, you know, it's great to see you. And I really enjoyed seeing them because I hadn't seen them on social media. I hadn't seen them online anywhere. So when I saw them, I'm like, oh, God, this is amazing and it felt so good I came away feeling like I'd had real connection which I'd not had with those people for that time mm -hmm. but as well I believe if you know and I have faith that if we're meant to experience something or you're meant to see someone it can happen the universe can bring you what you want and a prime example of this is I was walking with my dad when I moved back to Yorkshire and I was walking with my dad and I was like wouldn't it be nice if I saw a few people that I'd not seen for years and he's like yeah that would be lovely because I'd not you know not spent time with my friends for a long time because I don't have social media I thought how do you contact someone without social media and then as I'm walking over the bridge a friend of mine that I used to hang around with all the time is walking under it and we're talking like in the middle of nowhere pretty much it's not really where you'd walk it's like the long dual carriageway he's walking down and I'm just like Cade and I looked and I oh my god and I started chatting we swapped numbers and then I went for walks with him and had this nice connection with him and he's you know I still think he's a great friend but I was naturally meant to see him 
naturally is the most important thing that we're missing on this planet. Well, people will turn their nose up to that, though. When they, they when, will. When they hear it. I mean, do you, do you have a bit more, like, do you have a rebuttal to that? Because it, it's hard, because it, it's some, to some extent, I know, it's almost like a visceral faith you have. Mm-hmm. But I, I always try and think if I could relay that out more. I, I, I'm, I'm, it's hard to express, really. Because I, I, I do believe it. For me, faith is what's got me through the darkest days of my life. Mm-hmm. So for me, if someone says they haven't got faith, I'm like, okay, cool. That doesn't affect me, because I have. You know, and I'm not saying, oh, I've got something you haven't. Faith for me is so important because the world, the construct, the system that we have around us is breaking down in so many ways. If you don't have faith right now in something coming your way or something working out for you, it's a very dark and a very lonely place. Mm. And faith isn't something that just happens, you know, that you just get. Yeah, this is not like what, this is not the secret we're talking about. No. Here, like that's as in the book. Where that's the law of like, attraction. You can go itself. down that rabbit hole. Yeah. And, you know, it works great for some people that can't deny that it works mm-hmm. great for some people for me you know that's a habit of law of attraction is where you believe something so therefore you manifest into your life mm-hmm. faith is greater than a belief a belief can change it can keep you in a box it can be a certain thing so if you believe in trump and you believe in biden and you you know it can cause division in that because if something's not happening the way you want it to and you really believe it's going to it can be very hard until it arrives you'll be like oh why is it not happening yet and it can bring in doubt when you've got faith, there's no space for doubt. Faith is like something great, regardless of what happens, regardless of whether Trump wins or Biden wins or whatever the difference is, you're okay. So for me, my faith is in something, I've, I don't know what it is, but whenever I've needed it, I'm just like, help me out, mate, because I'm a bit yeah. stuck. You, there's def- and there's something definitely happens. at the very least a, a recognisable energy that is yeah. and something that's hard to, hard to deny because it will happen. If, yeah, and that's yeah. where the magic and the synchronicities and the coincidences or whatever you want to call them, Everything shows up when you need it, if you trust. And as soon as I started getting out of my way and I started moving out of this space of, oh, I need to control this and I need to make this and I like this. Getting, out of, get, getting out of my own way. I think yeah. a good way to put it. And it's, as soon as I started getting out of what I thought I wanted, what I actually needed showed up. Mm. But I wasn't ordering that. You know, everybody tries to order boyfriends or girlfriends or whatever it is from these apps that's just, let's bring in this to my life because this is what I want. You know, that's temporary. And I was on an app. I've, I've been on it three times for like a, the longest I've been on is a week. Yeah. And I, I think put, everyone tries. I'm yeah, and everyone tries. And, 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 and I, that's what it is. Yeah. I don't want that. I don't want my life to be ordered via you know an Argos type situation where you're just bringing it in. And it's nothing of worth really comes from those that I see in my for me personally comes in a way that I'm like, yeah, really, I really need to go through that route again. I've eliminated all those things that didn't serve me because I want to live in a different way. And they work for me, so why would I change them? But they might work for someone. But the idea of faith is, I have faith that you know my man's out there. I have faith that what it is that's meant to happen in my life will happen. I have faith that I will get to where I'm meant to go. I don't yeah. know where I'm meant to go. God's got a better plan than I have because every time I make a plan, it kind of goes out the window. But I have faith that, you know, and that's what keeps me happy. I genuinely wake up happy because I don't know what's going to happen in the day, which means I'm not fixed on something definitely happening. And then when it doesn't, I feel disappointed. And it all starts with faith in yourself. That, yeah. That's what, yeah. Talk to us about sobriety. And, and in, in more elaborate terms, how did you get there? How hard was it? Do you, and then, and, well, let's start with that. How did you get to sobriety in the first place? Okay. So, um, for me personally, I used to do a lot of drugs, ketamine, MDMA, whatever, pills. I was eating them like a Pac-Man, literally, like, constantly, just in every club I went into. It was like, if I'm going raving, I'm taking pills. And they just went hand in hand. And I had never done acid, ever. And I went, I was kind of seeing this guy, not seeing, that's the wrong word. We were sleeping together, let's be honest. We were sleeping together. And we were doing that for quite a while. He thought um, it was a relationship. He thought it was a relationship. Yeah. It definitely wasn't. <laughs> um, and we were sleeping with each other on and off for like five years or something stupid. Anyway, we go to Ibiza and we go to Pike's Hotel, which my friend now owns, Andy. Um, and we went to Pike's Hotel and we're there having this connection. I call them connections. I'll explain that later. But we see we, we decide not to do drugs. So we're just drinking alcohol. And then we're like, oh, yeah, let's not do drugs. And then this guy turns up. I know him for ages. It's some acid. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, hey, I've got this acid. It's amazing. I'm like, no, it's all right. I'm not really, not really feeling it. And, I, and then this guy's like, I've never done acid. He's like, well, I've never done either. And then this guy's like, oh, why don't you do it? 
because I thought I sod it. So we did this acid. We had amazing sex. It was great, brilliant. He went to sleep afterwards. I'm there, laid there, listening to XX, the album, Crystallized, and I'm looking in the mirror, sat there naked, looking in the mirror, as high as you could possibly imagine. And I shit you not, sorry, swearing. I shit you, can, you can swear as much as you want. Good, I love swearing. It makes me feel really good. Um, <laughs> it's like rebel. It's the last thing I can do. Like, yeah. uh, um, somebody will judge me for it later. But um, when I'm sat in the mirror, literally my higher self comes out of what seems to be the mirror and says to me, you are never going to get higher than this. You can stop now. And I'm like, okay. And I, I had nothing else. I'm in this state of pure bliss being told by my higher version of myself, like, done, 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 done. And I'm like, okay. So she disappears. I sit there. I'm in pure ecstasy. I wake up and I'm like, I ne- and I never wanted to take another drug again. So for me, it was a very weird moment because nobody ever told me. People always said, oh, don't look at yourself in the mirror on acid. I was having a whale of a time looking at myself. <laughs> I was having Naked, so much fun. Naked, checking myself out. I'm going, like, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. So I had this amazing time. And then I start drinking more because I'm not taking any drugs anymore. So mm. I swap one for the other, which obviously happens. And I start drinking way more. And uh, I'm getting a bit sluttier and a bit sluttier and a bit sluttier. And I'm out. And it's just not good. It's not, you know, I'm not really sober. I'm not really, you know being careful I'm not looking after myself a few things happened that didn't really you know shouldn't have really happened and I'm thinking maybe I'm drinking somebody said to me oh you, you drank a lot last night like you want to check because I, I used to work in clubs like I said with you do it like I can be in those environments it's fine and this guy was like you know you, you know, check how much you're drinking I'm like yeah, well so you get such a tolerance you don't realize yeah and then um I so I have this like little epiphany like yeah I should probably slow down then I go out for a glass of wine with a friend of mine. I have one glass of wine, wasn't drunk, but went back to my other friend's house. And she's like, oh, how did you get home? Taxi, you know, taxi, bus, whatever. And I'm like, I have no idea. And she's like, are you drunk? I was like, no. And I was totally sober, but I couldn't remember how I got back, whether it was yeah. a bus or whatever. So for that, I was thinking, that's really strange that I've just blanked. And then a friend of mine called me from Australia who just moved over there. And she'd been to see a tarot reader. Yeah, clairvoyant mm-hmm. and she said oh I've been to see the tarot reader and she's been talking about all this stuff her reading was amazing um, but she said you know I've got a tall blonde friend with a tattoo around her wrist and she works in a bar and I'm just like I'm listening I'm thinking what's going on and she said she says that you have to stop drinking otherwise you're going to get raped and I'm like what and she said yeah you're going to get you're going to get attacked she says it really freaked me out so obviously Jesus. it's me freaking me out. So I'm thinking, yeah, but yeah, the yeah. day before was the night where I couldn't remember anything. Right. Okay. And I was working in a bar and I was working in McQueen's in Shoreditch. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and you know, I used to get wasted. And I mean, it's, you know, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with McQueen's, but I was leaving there in, you know, in various states. And I had been spiked before. I've been spiked twice. Mm. And I, the first time I ever got spiked was at Amica. Really? Yeah. My, I literally just before I started working there, I went to go and speak with the owners. And um, I was having a chat. They said, I'll stay behind, have a drink at the bar, and got spiked. And I couldn't remember anything. And I, it was so embarrassing, that story. But um, yeah, and there's another time as well. So I know what that was like, and I'm thinking, I need to stop. Yeah. So I stopped. And then that's when it gets really difficult, because everything that you, you know, for me, not for everyone, but I'm pretty certain that most people can say this, I was drinking to avoid certain things, but not realizing it at the time. So when you stop drinking and you stop doing drugs, all of your emotions are like, hi, we're here. Um, I want to be dealt with. And you're thinking, oh my God, I feel uncomfortable. And I went through all of these different things where I was just waking up. I'd woken up, I keep using that term, but it's the best way of describing it, in 2009 to something wasn't right in the world. And I was looking into conspiracies and other te- like technologies in the world and all this crazy stuff. So I'd already kind of had that you know, awakening. I'd already had this weird higher self moment with acid. And now I'm having this kind of got to stop drinking. So every time I was being guided to something, it was for a greater purpose because my life was getting better and I was giving up things that weren't serving me, but it wasn't getting easier. And these emotions were so hard. And I remember I was crying. I can't really think about it. I was crying and to myself in my room, just looking and I have this relationship with the mirror. And I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like, I am fucked. I'm emotionally, I haven't dealt with anything that I had gone through when I was younger. And I went through so much abuse, horrific relationships. I was an angry teenager walking around as an adult thinking that I knew what was going on. I knew shit. 
I'm, I'd not dealt with what I needed to deal with. So I went through all of this stuff. I ended up having a breakdown. And I remember thinking to myself, because at the time I was practicing DJing and, and I'd been over in Dubai DJing and I was doing all this different stuff, listening to music all the time. And I remember I watched this um, program and I love this woman, even though some people think she's quite controversial. But for me, game change. She's called Teal Swan. And she did this video on how to feel your feelings, which is still online if anybody wants to watch it. And I watched that and she said, when you've got feelings, they start, then there's a horrific middle or a great middle, depending on how you're feeling. And then there's an end. And I was like, oh, so that means it can end. How I feel right now can end. But she says, you have to sit with it. Nothing else can go on. So I'm like switching off the phone, switching if I'm sat there in the dark and it's a little candle in front of a mirror and I'm just crying and crying and getting all of this emotion out. And just, it was awful but so liberating at the same time and I remember because I'd been listening to music there was a part of me that because I couldn't drink and because I couldn't take this or do that there was something I needed a distraction so I thought well maybe I can put music on and I remember that that also is a distraction because if I felt shit I'd put music on to make myself feel better and nobody would ever think there was a problem with that apart from that you're avoiding the feeling that you're well, it's a different vib- vibration, Exactly, yeah. so you're elevating yourself, which it can be good and does feel better, and highly music is therapy in some ways, but I was still avoiding what I was feeling. So I committed, I thought, right, I've given up alcohol, drugs, all this stuff. I also had given up sex at that point, which is another story entirely, but I thought if I can give these things up, I need to give up music just for a bit, and I spent four months without playing any music. I wouldn't put it on because I knew the need for music that I had was again getting me to avoid myself and I, for me it transformed sitting in silence and learning to meditate game changed everything because mm. I was like oh my god I can feel you know and people go you're right and I'm like not really <laughs> no and then they were getting really uncomfortable because I was being honest and I saw that it wasn't just me that had the problem it was everyone around me because mm. nobody could deal with the truth my truth is I felt shit you don't want to sit in a room with me when I'm feeling shit because I'm moody as hell I'm aware that I've got quite a lemony personality if I'm not quite feeling great I'm not, you know, I'm not the best person to hang around with in that way. So I was like, I'm not even going to put anyone through that. I'm going to do it all on my own. And my mum and dad thought I was going crazy. They kept coming to knock on the bedroom door. They're like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Fine means fucking incapable of normal emotions. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, and it, yeah, and brilliant. at the time I was so, I couldn't even speak couldn't even say what I wanted to do and I was reading and reading and reading and books became also a bit of an addiction at that time but I was learning at the same time and then practicing what it would say in the book and this it was the most beautiful cathartic experience ever to sit with silence and not have distractions and for me that helped me get to where I am because I went through everything it's like when you say to an alcoholic oh I don't go to the bar anymore I'm you know I'm fine if you can't go to the bar, you haven't healed yourself. You're just avoiding. Mm. It might be great that you've avoided it for four years, but if you can't go in there and say no, you haven't learned anything. You've avoided, and we can avoid stuff, like, amazingly. So for me, I didn't want to be in that experience where I can't go to another bar again because I want to see my mates. I mean, it's not going to happen now, obviously, when people stop drinking. There are no <laughs> bars to go to, really. But back then, I'm like, I don't want to give up partying. You know, I love being in Ibiza. I love raving. I love, this is who I am, the music. You can can enjoy that now. Yeah, I love it. You know, when I moved to Ibiza after all this happened, everyone was like, oh, you're going to Ibiza. You're going to definitely drink again. You'll definitely be taking pills again. You can't not. I went sober and I lived there for almost three or four years. Sober. Have have you relapsed ever? Never. So with my alcohol, um, I bought, so somebody gave me a Bailey's with coffee in it to see what my reaction would be. I was like, dick thing to do yeah nice but nice. um nice person i was like oh it tastes like christmas in a cup it was like it's all these christmasy like wasted drinks that i'd always remember drinking baileys and getting shit faced when i was little well, not little but when i was younger than four but when i was younger and i thought oh it just reminds me of all those times when i felt sick at christmas so i gave that away and then i bought i went to woo moon and i bought i thought do you know what i'm gonna buy a shandy and i bought myself a shandy i have one sip of it and this really hot Italian guy walks past, takes this drink, puts it down, spins me around, starts dancing with me. And I was just like, oh. And he was just like, come this way. And he, he just led me on and I just left my drink. And I was That's like, That's our for you. Right? Hot I'm Italian like, guy. Thank you. So, yeah, Ludo, thank you for that. You got me from drinking, bless him. Um, but yeah, really nice guy. And I was just like, this is more interesting than a shandy. So, I. So, the clo- closest moments you got to it, you, Yeah. Maybe, it's just, there's nothing, there's no with real. Thanks to the university, you got. 
no. taken away from it quite quickly. There's no, there's, there's no need for me to take MDMA. I'm not interested in ketamine. I'm not interested in... If I've done anything, I've done mushrooms. I was going to touch on that. Yeah, yeah. I've done psychedelics yeah. and mushrooms and stuff. But for me, you know, I started growing my own mushrooms and having these experiences and feeling great. But I, this wasn't when I was going through this sober process. Okay, I guess also you're... I would assume, anyway, that that was a stage where you're really looking at it almost on an intellectual, spiritual yeah. basis. Yeah, it was a and very spiritual and you, were, and you were very balanced with, with yeah. your approach to it, I guess. Yeah, I'd say if anybody's out there that's judging psychedelics right now because you've not done them, you're not able to judge something you haven't experienced or done. Mm. And for me, I used to, when I'd given up drugs and alcohol and everything, I was the same. I'm like, why do you need, you know, why do you need mushrooms or whatever? But then I realized that mushrooms are nothing like any form of chemical drug that we do. I also did ayahuasca. Um, and, you know, having done DMT, chunga, ayahuasca, and all of that, I thought, I'll oh, give mushrooms a try. Mm. And, you know, amazing experience. I don't think everybody needs them. Mm. For sure, I know, I think most people don't need them. Um, well, it's exploring pop prop. I actually haven't done it. Um, but I'm open to doing it. But mm-hmm. I do have a slight fear of exploring a part of the brain that I may not want to go to. And, and addressing perhaps fears yeah. that. It's a fear like, of like, the like I've done, I've, I've, I've never been like heavily addicted to any drug, but I've, I've, done, like, I've tried plenty of drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, and some just really put me off, like I wouldn't, won't, won't go near them, it just scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Now, I would say those were A class type drugs, right? So, but psychedelics, like, it's, it's a tricky one to, to understand my feelings towards it. It's definitely something that I'm fascinated about, mm-hmm. but I'm still got a bit of a barrier to let myself do it. It's a bit like fireworks. Like you look and you're, oh my god, it's amazing, but then they're gone. You know, once you're back in this reality, you're back to who you are. You've got a slightly different perception on the world. You see things slightly differently, but you still got your problems. You still got to deal with them. And this is when people really get excited about ayahuasca and, and psychedelics, and they're constantly escaping themselves. And I'm like, it's not for that. That's the yeah. It's not for you it's to keep going. It's a new sense going. of discovery, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's what it's really about. But again, somebody would say, who am I to say it's not for them? And that's a fair point. Mm. Uh, you know, we don't know everything, but from my experience, which I have a lot in, and I've, I've seen a lot of people in this situation um, that go from taking a lot of drugs and a lot of alcohol who have a very short stint on like mushroom microdosing or whatever they do, and they don't want to take any more drugs. Well, it they sounds to me like micro, I've, I've read into a lot of the microdosing with psilocybin, yeah. literally, and so much so I know they're doing it in Imperial College and places like yeah. that, testing it. it. sounds to me like there's a real potential for there to is, help depression, anxiety, PTSD, that sort of thing. it gives you a level of awareness, and that awareness could be just enough to get you to stop doing the drugs and the alcohol. I'm not so saying you, it's you, a solution. you think it's that, that introspective ability is just in mm-hmm. everything? Emphasized. So, if someone is not per se particularly emotionally intelligent, whatever, well, they could be and do it anyway. But mm-hmm. for people of that ilk, would it would help even more? You think? The way I see psychedelics and meditation and anything that can get you to have an alternative view on your current reality, when you come back into this reality, it's almost like you've got this three second awareness where you used to act, you used to get responsive, and you, used mm. to, you know, now you're like, oh, okay, I want to respond in this way. Sure. It's not massive. It's not the biggest window of time ever. It's just like this very little shift in per- like perception where you're thinking, oh, should I have done? You might do it still, but then you go away thinking, should I have done that? It sounds, just sounds gives to me you like a it a bit more of an equilibrium in your brain. It does. It, you, you have a greater reflection on the acts that you're doing, you know, that you're taking part in. And you also have this deeper level of insight because when you take any psychedelic, it puts you in the now. Mm. You are here. You're not, you know, you're not, you might be looking at what happened in the past, but you're looking at it in a sense from a current perspective. So you're solving things sometimes from the past or you're seeing it in a different way. We're like, oh, actually, that wasn't his fault. That was mine. You're actually looking what they, you know, what people call the now the truth. And I highly, you know, I agree with that. And if you're living your life constantly looking backwards or constantly looking forward, you're not here today. And psychedelics and meditation, more than psychedelics, put you here so you can make a decision on what's happening in your life. And that, for me, is fundamental. But I wouldn't say that, you know, psychedelics are the solution. If anybody said to me, what is the solution for life? My would be meditation. Whatever that might be for you. It's a reflection on yourself that allows you to become a greater version of you. Mm. How hard is it, do you think, to stay in the now? You don't know you're in it, really, until you're out of it. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. So when you're in it, you're just flowing and you're doing your thing and then you come out, oh, that's really focused time. Sure. You're not thinking when you're in there. 
you might just feel very relaxed. Um, but There's a certain serenity to it. I've very, that. yeah. But I mean, I haven't had it much. But We've all been in the now at some point because we've all enjoyed a moment where we're just in that moment. But people spend their lives trying to be in the now. You're not going to get there. It, it comes naturally. It becomes out of something that you're fundamentally in the flow of what you're meant to be doing. And for me, the way I look at it is meditation taught me just to sit a little bit longer and a little bit longer. And even if it was feeling more uncomfortable, a little bit longer. And that taught me patience. And when you do that enough, you start to feel like, you know, the bus is not here yet. I'll wait a little bit longer. Do it's you fine. think meditation has been, been a fundamental or an integral part of your life that's kept you off, kept, kept you sober? Yeah, definitely, because I feel like that gives me time and space to reflect. And you only change anything in your life when you reflected on it and thought, that was probably the wrong thing to do. Or that was really good, I want to do it again. Like, that gives you more reflection time. And it also, you know, scientifically, I don't know all the stats, but scientifically, I mean, I feel great when I do it, mm. and I feel great afterwards when I do it, and I know when I need to do it. Mm. And I become more relaxed. Like you were saying with your breathing, you love it. And it, it's, it takes you to a space in yourself I didn't even know existed before I started doing it. And then when I found it, I didn't want to leave doing my meditation practice. I'm like sat there in my bedroom constantly wanting to meditate more. But I was reading longer. I was staying awake more. I was taking on information more. I wasn't as angry. I wasn't bitching. I wasn't gossiping. Everything started to get better because I was learning to meditate. But, you know, people say, oh, I can't meditate. Some people can't at certain times. Nobody can't ever. It's just that, it, you know, I've recently found out I've got ADHD. I didn't know that and I was trying to meditate so mm. it was more difficult for me and I didn't have a teacher I was learning like literally from YouTube watching things and reading things and trying it for myself and just like, oh, I've got to sit here I've got to sit here stay here stay here stay here and just get it can be that. learned though it can be learned no matter yeah. not no matter what condition but yeah. potential men mental things like ADHD it can be yeah in, but a lot of uh, for me the way I look at it, this is why I do personal responsibility coaching if you sort out your whatsapps and your emails and you do your to-do list and you've got on top with everything and you're up to date You've shifted 90% of the bullshit you're living in. And then you can sit there. And in that space, you can relax. But if you've got... It, it, I, I look at it... But the power of order is just... Yeah. But it's like, it's I look at it, you've got Facebook, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, email. You might have more than one email account. Then you've got your phone. Then you've got your messaging service. Then you've got your parents. Then you've got your friends. Then you've got... We have never been so available to everyone as we have now. So of course it's going to feel like shit when you're trying to meditate because there's a million and one distractions. It, it, that just happens naturally. But as you eliminate those distractions, like we were saying earlier, so you eliminate things. In order to get something in your life, something has to go. You've got to make space for it. If you're not making any space, and I don't just mean like physical chucking out my trousers so I can fit more in my wardrobe. I'm talking about energetic, metaphysical space mm. where you are clearing energy because you might feel like if you haven't cleared on all your WhatsApps and you haven't answered everyone, every time you open it or whether you've got notifications on, you're reminded, I haven't done that. Oh, shit, I need to get back to that person. Yeah, I haven't done that. Oh, I oh, can't. don't want to talk about that now. The amount of blocks you have in WhatsApp alone can give you anxiety. And then the I rest agree. of it. Yeah. When I'm trying to get stuff done, I just put my phone. I, yeah. try, I try and literally throw it in the bin in, in a metaphorical sense yeah. that I, I know it's not there. Or else I can't. Not necessarily give me anxiety, but it just... It just Stops me doing stuff I need to do. Yeah, and it, these distractions are so readily available. And if you've got an addiction to any of these platforms, it's going to be twice as hard for you to put your phone down. So yeah. it's it's so and it's like you've got you might have seven or eight addictions in one phone because you might be addicted to all the different social medias and the attention you're getting from somebody that might not be a healthy relationship. There's so many parts to this environment in your phone that you can be addicted to. It's not just one thing. You're not just addicted to your. You can also be addicted to your phone because of the information that comes from it. So I had to break it all down, and I was just like going to that, that, that. And I people say to me now, like, oh, you know, what else do you do? You know, what, what are your vices? And I'm like, oh, I still eat sugar. I shouldn't, you know, still buy Snickers do, quite do miss, often. Do you miss alcohol ever? No. Truly not. No, do, do you know, I, I actually... You have heart say, I do not miss it. I don't know what there is to miss. I'm, you know, I, I miss raving, because now we can't do it anymore. But, like, I miss raving, but it was the music and the friends. It wasn't mm. the me getting wasted. But... I look at alcohol and I, I think, wow, you know, I spent so much of my time on alcohol. I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to you know, say I regret it as such because I don't. I had some amazing times. I did feel shit as well. But 
I looked at a gin bottle. I used to drink gin, lemonade, and blackcurrant as one of my drinks. And I looked at these gin bottles. Yeah. <laughs> and I looked at I these. Really like that. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at these gin bottles a little while ago. I think it was last year. And there's so many amazing gins out now. There's mm. like this rhubarb gin thing. I forgot what it was rhubarb. And it was an amazing, sexy bottle. And I'm like, oh my god, I'm a marketing whore. Anything that looks good, I'm like, I want to buy, 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 buy. I wanted this bottle. I don't want gin, but I wanted to try it because it was so well marketed. And this is the problem that we're living in. They're marketing stuff to us in such a way that we are constantly stimulated by our environment. Well, I just think there's so much knowledge of how the, the brain works. that it's, it's hitting these sort of subtle chain reactions in your brain that, that you, you wouldn't even know unless you yeah. really sort of investigated it yourself. If anything's pink, I usually buy it. I'm, <laughs> it's, I'm so bad. I, and people are pink. But really, you're a pink girl? I'm like, yeah. Like it's, I don't know what it is. It's just, I love pink. You know, look at all my branding. And it's I do too. I used to wear colors. pink as a baby. Still do now sometimes. In fact, when we FaceTimed, I had a pink hoodie on. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah, there you yeah. go. There you go. I bought into a man, it. A man comfortable with uh, the colour pink. Yeah, I liked it. Um, tell us about I Am Sound Radio. And what I mean by that is, that's a terrible start to a question. Why I Am Sound Radio? Why, why, why did you decide to do I Am Sound Radio? And, and, and yeah, let's just start with that. Okay. Oh, with that uh okay so i am sound wasn't uh, radio wasn't originally a radio station i when i was um in bed from my back situation sat in the mirror again um when i could finally sit and not lay down um sat in the mirror because i always go to the mirror and have these conversations and i'm sat in the mirror and i'm talking to myself what do i do i've lost everything what is it i'm trying to do i had this other business that has been in r&d for ages but it wasn't setting my soul on fire and I'm thinking, where do, where's my next bit of inspiration? And again, higher self was just like, what is it that you enjoy? Because if you do that, other people who enjoy that stuff too will come. Just do that. And I thought, well, I love conspiracies. I love talking about other world stuff. I love talking about aliens. I love talking about like sacred geometry and science. I mean, I couldn't stand anything at school. I was like there just because balls were there. I was such a flirt. I never wanted to learn anything. Now I'm like learning things all the time. So, and I love science. I'm, I never knew I love science. I'm like, oh my God, I love science. So I'm learning all these things. And I'm like, how do I make a job of this? I'm trying to think. And then I love sound and I love music. And I remember thinking, Sound comes up everywhere, whether it's you're looking at architecture, whether you're looking at the nature of the reality, whether you're looking at mathematics, whether it, like sound is connected to everything. So what is this? So I started going on this bit of rabbit hole journey about sound. And I, uh, and I listened to this amazing, um, beautiful piece of music. And um, it's basically I Am That I Am. It's by Jonathan Goldman. It's incredible. And... Um, it was basically talking about energy and, and music and sound. And I'm like, oh, we are made of sound. Like, we are. This is who we are. It's energy. It's vibration. I'm going to start there. So I thought, whatever it is, it's going to be It's going to be called I Am Sound. That's the name of it. And then I thought, right, what if I did a subscription business where people could just come and learn about all this stuff and I make it really fun so I start getting creative. And I had this idea of having a, a subscription business for creatives and then entrepreneurs and musicians that wanted to learn about sacred geometry, all this stuff, but in a pragmatic way. So it's not too spiritual too businessy or brain hacking it's just coming to learn all the what stuff is, what is sacred ge sacred geometry sacred geometry is basically um <laughs> looking at like mathematics in a different way there's ancient uh, mathematical principles that are all around us different shapes there's you know we just think we've got squares and triangles and circles and all that kind of stuff there's so many different shapes out there that all interconnect and they're found in nature everywhere and if like there's just so much out there that's just incredible it's like the flower of life that you might have seen that's you know it's one of the the kind of pictures that it that portrays is sacred geometry so i'm learning about all this stuff and i thought i'm just going to start this subscription business and i'm going to make it all about kind of because i realized that what got through what got me through my sob sobriety is my interests and in things and if you've given stuff up what are you interested in what do you now want to do when you don't get wasted every weekend so you learn new hobbies and you go out and do things. So I thought maybe I'm the brand that sits there and can help people make that transition because I've done it. So I thought about doing that and I, I had an amazing team. We were working at the Ministry of Sound uh, co-working space in London and everything was coming together and we'd got to all these different music events and we were literally going to teach people about sound and about the structure of like vibration and energy and how they can understand that they are that and that they can go on and, and learn more things. And then COVID hit. <laughs> And I'm like, nice timing. This is what I'm saying. Whenever I've got a plan, God's got a better one. Because like, what I've got now is far better than what I had. And I, I thought to myself, what am I meant to do? 
So I went home to my parents' house with no team, no investor, like uh, like the investor that I wanted because it backed out just last minute. I'm thinking I had everything and it was all exciting and branded in great colours and now I've got nothing. Again, like what happened to me before. And I thought, well, I'm just going to sit and wait. And one of my other friends called me and I'm doing two things at one time, chatting to him. And I go through this drawer of stuff. And when I was in Ibiza before I broke my back, I'd written a letter to myself and I put it in an envelope. And it said, you are creating this radio station. You are, like, I am, sorry. I am creating this radio station. I am. And I had a date on it, open on the, se- on the um, 17th of March, 2020. But this was in 2018 when I wrote it. So I'm talking to my friend. I'm like, oh my God, I've just found this letter. What date is it? And he's like, it's the 18th of March. And I was like, oh. so I open it. And I've got this letter to myself that I'd written. I get goosebumps when I think about it. And it's just describing this epic radio station where we do like what you're doing in the media and teaching people about all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's what I Am Sound supposed to be. It's supposed to be a radio station with all the music combined. And I thought, well, it's wellness and dance music. They're the two things I love the most. You can rave and then you can go and like do a really amazing retreat or whatever. And I'm learning sound and understanding the nature of reality at the same time. So I put it all together. And um, I didn't have the team, so I had to redo everything on my own, which showed me that I could actually do what I needed to do. So I was quite happy with myself. And now we have a series of content um, called the Talkwoods, which is awkward talks about things that matter, similar setup as this. But we talk about all the most awkward shit that goes on in life in a podcast format on the radio. And where, where, can, they find, where can people find you? I am soundacademy.com. I am soundacademy.com. I literally lost my domain yesterday. Oh my God, it was so bad lost my domain for an hour <laughs> and I'm like oh my god lost it and had to renew it and uh, but it's back so you can go to the, the music you're choosing by the way yeah. is uh, so good I, I, I listened to it, yes. some of it this morning and I was just like <laughs> I just, like went straight on your website and it just started playing something I was just like oh this is yeah I'm just enjoying this I had my headphones on I was actually mm-hmm. funny enough doing some research on you yeah and um, I don't know what it was it felt it sounded like I was in Bali what time was it it was about maybe 10 ish okay yeah it so, was very much, it was like, mm-hmm, I, I'm not going to do it. But it was basically like, <laughs> I felt it. like I was in Bali or Sri Lanka or something like that. Yeah, well, I've never and been to like, Bali. And that really got me. It felt really yeah. atmospheric. and That's what I wanted. And, I, you know, there's nothing that goes on the station unless it gives me goosebumps or makes me feel great. Yeah, it yeah. Will not that's what I felt. Station. I felt you were, re- you're obviously taking quite a, um, quite a lot of time in, in considering what you're putting out there. Yeah, and I, and I, and for me, I, when I was DJing, I didn't really love playing out. I didn't love DJing, but I love choosing music. Mm. And I can put it in a great order and people are like, oh my God, your track selection's amazing. I'm like, win. But I don't want to play out to a thousand people, but I can do it for a radio. And I, you know, I trained in radio. I was radio production and at Point Blank Music College. And I love talking, obviously, as you can tell. <laughs> but I, you know, it's Good something... Good talking, though. Useful talking. You. But rubbish. I never used to talk about stuff that was interesting. I was full of shit when I was younger. Now, I'm a little bit more, you know, I know spaces between sentences. I know what silence can do. I know the power of actually, you know, having a good conversation with someone. So I'm using that in the radio. Um, and what I'm doing is I want to make these awkward conversations available to everyone. But in, a, in amongst all that, you need to have good music. So I, I decided to put the whole day as you start off with the sound of the birds or the sound of the waves, whatever it is. Then it goes into your sound yoga. Of Bali, or sound of Bali. Yeah. But then you go into your yoga music. And then I go into like kind of more of a, uh, like a heart space where it's all really nice music and quite chilled. And then we carry on with the day in the afternoon. It becomes really fun with like your biggest artist in the world. We've got like yeah. Sasha, we've got Roger Sanchez, we've got We've got Maceo Plex, we've got quite a few on there. So when you say we've got, you've actually got them playing playlists for you? Yes, yeah, so they've got radio shows. Things, they've right? got radio shows that they already syndicate to distribute. So I've got those. I used to run a, um, I used to have a radio syndication business before. So I had lots of artists that I worked with. So I used that content in the afternoons on the station. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then in the evening, you wind down actually so I was like right these are going to be more chilled things we've got kids stuff coming on as well like little kids stories to get the kids to be grateful Amazing, before yeah, they yeah. go to bed and then we've got sound healing content which I'm putting together um, with a number of different yeah, sound I noticed that. that sounds yeah. I don't really know much about it so it's really, really it's incredible. just a, a beautiful collection of artists just to talk uh, sorry just to come on and explain a little bit of what they do and then showcase their music um, and then in the eat like after that we've got ceremony music so it's pretty you know got binaural beats we've got all the stuff you'd hear at an ayahuasca ceremony, mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. It's very tribal, but also very relaxing. 
and I just wanted the whole schedule just to be like a natural day of yeah. How I was saying you want to cater to, to, to someone's day, so if yeah. they did listen to it the whole day, they really would feel yeah, they'd feel the like they've been on a journey. Yeah. And you know, I want to, I really want to get into doing a, a live um, call in talk show, which I will do at some point. But you know, I've got we've got an app. If you want to go on the app, you can download it at the App Store or the Play Store. It's I Am Sound and I Am Sound Radio. And you can get the app and then you can watch all the content that we put on there as well. And it's I'm doing it all with no social media. No, I'm just doing it when I meet people. And See, kids, it can be done. Yeah, it, it can. can. It can be done. I'll be honest, I, I, I'm, I'm, you, you persuaded me more in, in that sense. I, I still think, especially with what we're doing, we're doing so much content or plan to do so much content. Mm-hmm. It's going to be hard not to, to avoid it completely. Yeah. Not, not yeah. But it's... It definitely needs to be limited. Use use the right reasons, like I said. And if we and if we can educate, that'd be great. Yeah. And um, tracking back a bit on the personal responsibility thing, what's what's a classic classic example of some, what someone will come to you with? I guess problem wise, how how's it all start? A really messy life. Okay. They're my best clients. I love <laughs> them. Anybody that's got oh my god, I'm so overwhelmed. I don't know where to begin. Like, come find me. That's, yeah. I geek out on being able to help people. Where dump. can they find you for that as well? Where's Nat at dot com. Where's Nat? If you just where's Nat at dot Where's com. Nat at dot com, guys? There you go. Or you just type in Nat Rich, and I've dominated Google because you kind of have to when you're not on social media. So mm-hmm. I've, mm-hmm. I've sassed it on Google top three pages. I learned all that by myself as well. <laughs> I was going to pay someone. I'm like, actually, you don't need to. You can learn on YouTube. Those sort of things you can learn. Yeah, time, but it's just it's just time consuming, isn't it? Well, I had you know lockdown. <laughs> yeah. I like, okay, YouTube SEO, but it showed me that I didn't know I could do that. You know, I didn't pay myself for it. I should have done. But the idea of you know being able to support yourself and do things that you never thought possible is so available to us now. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, with the personal responsibility stuff, I forgot what your question was. The question is how. What's the classic example of someone coming to you? What, oh, happened, yeah. what, like, what I would say is, give us an example of what happens. Like yeah. Someone comes to you, what, what do you help them with? What, so, what are maybe some principles or foundational blocks you're trying to create and all these sort of things? I use Lego. Yeah, I remember you saying that earlier. That, that, that was quite, Lego. That did, that seemed quite a mystery to me. <laughs> okay, so if you, uh, for example, I take on people who are really messy or entrepreneurs who have no idea. They've got a really good idea, but they've got no idea about how they're going to achieve it. Mm-hmm. And what we do in the first one is, is just a massive brain dump. And I section the brain dump into certain columns and you just tell me absolutely everything that you need to do, should have done, meant to do, want somebody else wants you to do, or a project you might never do, whatever it is, this entire landscape in your head, we get it onto a spreadsheet that I create. So you just give me everything. Then I organize it. So I go through, once I've done that, I then go through your values. Your value that, so if if I said to you, what are your values in life? What would you say your top three values were? Hard I've really got to think about. I'd say being the best I can be. Mm-hmm. I'd say helping other people. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's a value, but I definitely like. I'm obsessed with creating a warmth and, and quality life for people around me. Mm-hmm. That would be the three things. Really. So those are all great things that you want to live by, and whatever it is you want in your life. There's a guy called jo- Dr. John D. Martini who's got this book called The Values Factor. So if you know you never come to me for training, go to this book. He teaches you everything. So I do this in this second um, second hour with the clients. Is we go through your values, and values are not love, respect, and trust. Values are what you spend the most time on. So if you spend your time on social media more than you do with your family, your values are showing that you value social media more than your family. Well, so you mean more assess what your values are right right now. So yeah, so. Your values, people get confused by them. We're meant to because, live by Because them. maybe I was saying principles, right? This is the thing. So this is his whole book is that we've got, on a global scale, we've got values wrong. So he's got these set questions that teach you or that basically give you the answers to what you truly value. So we go through that with the clients because they'll be telling me that they value something. Some oh, I value my girlfriend and then she's nowhere. When she finished the questions, she's like nowhere on the value list. And they're like, oh, I'm like, okay, is she the right girlfriend? Have you misplaced her? Should you be doing more? Because we can see if we know where you're at with your values or what you think they are and then they're completely different, we can align you back up into what it is that truly matters. So we do that. And then the third one is we so, go through... Sorry, could you, could you be more... Um, so what is a good example of, of when people start to realise their values? What normally is it? So, like, for example, my values is personal development. That's the oh. thing I value most. I'm constantly yes. doing it. It's constantly seen in my life. When you talk to me, it's about personal development. Everything I do is personal development. Relationships. If you need me at any time, I'll answer the phone for you. 
they're that important to me and people will vouch for that anywhere. The next one for me was financial freedom. I valued it so highly I was constantly working and trying to make my financial freedom. And so these are the things that I value, that I'm in alignment with. So if I know these are my priorities, I'm going to spend my time doing things that I value because that's where your happiness is. So for me, if I'm doing personal development, I know I'm in alignment with myself. Sure. If I'm doing, you know, if I'm working on my financial freedom, I know I'm in alignment with myself. And if I'm spending time with my friends, I'm in alignment with myself. So I wanted to constantly be in alignment with what truly makes me happy because that's when you're happy, things can flow and you are a better version of yourself and you can get more done. If you're in resistance to that or you're out of alignment, it can be a nightmare. And that's when you feel overwhelmed or anxious. So the, the importance of doing this in the second week is to get people aligned with what they actually want because they might be telling me something and it's nowhere in their life, but they really want it. So then it would be, okay, well, now when I make your weekly structure on the third week, in that structure, in that weekly plan that I give you, you've got to have time for what you truly love. And then they make time for it. And then they're like, oh, I feel so much better because I'm doing my... <sighs> then they're like oh i'm making time because i'm doing my spiritual work so but so would values be fitness yeah if, it, if that's what you truly value and that's yeah. what you love doing and you can see evidence for it in your life so then you yeah. think you would you i'm just trying to hone in a bit on on values you'd say it's very it's got to be very personal to you as opposed to an outward principle that you want to affect other people that, that's two different things yeah uh, affecting uh, like affect yourself first mm -hmm. if you affect yourself in a good positive way you're leading by example that you'll affect other people and other people will come to you because they see such a positive change in you. But if we start trying to help other people before we've helped ourselves, we become exhausted. We're not the best versions of ourselves and we're trying to please. It's like when I said with the toilet roll earlier. It's like if I'm trying to put the new toilet roll on just because I want him to approve of me, it's exhausting. So your values are for you. And they're a side of your girlfriend, they're a side of your family, they're a side of your kids. People go, oh my God, my kids are what I value. All right. And then sometimes they're number six on the list and I'll ask for the top five. So it's like, where are the kids? And then, oh my God, I should do that. And it's like, because they valued something else, work that wasn't making them happy over their kids, they're like, oh my God, I need to switch that. Mm. So then they come into alignment, they spend more time with their kids. Mm. So it's just a simple set of questions. I mean, this guy is an absolute rock star when it comes to personal development, but it's 13 questions. And then beyond that, I ask you what the most, what, I, I literally say, name me. This guy being the author you mentioned. Yeah, jo yeah. Dr. John D. Martini. Then after that, I'm like, right, okay, give me 10 things that you'd like to make money from. And this is something I've designed myself, but it's literally a list of 10 things that you want to make money from. And when they give me this list, I'm then like, right, okay, now we've got your 10 things. I'm going to go through and you need to give me a number based on how excited you are about doing this job. So they'll say, oh, I want to take pictures or film stuff or read for a living or I want to talk for a living. And I'll get them to rate it from 1 to 10, 10 being my God, fucking amazing, I love this. One being, mm, not really sure I want to do it. So they rate it. And then the final question is like, okay, we're going to go back to what you love, back to what you want to do. But now I'm going to ask you if you had to do it every day or you didn't get paid for it, give me a number next to that. So when they filter it even more, they end up with three out of 10 that they actually want to do. You get to that real root. Yeah, root interest, you get to the yeah. root of what it is you actually want to do. And then we work on that. And then your structure's made from that. There's no point in me making you a structure or saying, Liam, let's work on your life when you don't even know what it is you want to do. And I know that I'm so, like, I can think so greatly. It's exhausting. My ideas are exhausting. And entrepreneurs think all the time and they come up with new business ideas every day. Stick to what you really want to do. And this is how I figured it out for myself. So that now I do it with other people. Well, what's your biggest fear? Losing my faith. Interesting. Okay. Um, I didn't know that until you asked me the question, so thank you, because that's quite good to know. Good, okay. What's your, what's your <laughs> biggest concern for society? Ooh, Jesus Christ, you want another hour? Um, well, well, technically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk for as long as you want. Okay, the, my biggest concern... I'd, I'd, I'd say try pinpoint it to one. Yeah, my biggest concern for society. That's a really good question you're good at this you should do this for a living <laughs> it's funny you should say that no, i'm trying no, right? to no i think it's gonna work um oh god do you know what it's our biggest concern is our lack of being able to communicate and what i mean by that is that there's a lot of information out there for us to become aware of and 
we ha- we are a overloaded, but when we learn something new, and I'm going to go down the conspiracy on this one, when we learn something new and we want to tell someone else, potentially get, not a conspiracy, by the way, it could just be actual truth. Could be actually, but when I'm saying conspiracy, I'm going to say in terms of a conspiracy or just new information. But this is happening a lot this year, so I'm going to cover it there. If I learn something new and I'm super excited and I feel like I know something and I want to share it because I feel like it will help you. Okay, I'm super excited. If I haven't controlled how to deliver that information to you, I'm going to shout it at you. I'm going to force it on you. I'm going to want you to know about that, regardless of whether it's the right time, whether you want to know or whether you even care. Yeah, because I'm so excited because I haven't learned how to communicate. If you don't agree with this thing that I've now shoved into your reality, you don't know how to tell me that it's probably not the right time. It's not really what you want to know right now. And you're, you're going to look at it later, but it's not. You don't really need it today. You just go fuck off or you're an idiot or you're a conspiracy theorist or that's not true or that's bullshit or I don't believe you so we get into this judging game I just want to share something with you because I think it's going to help humanity and that's what I want to really communicate but I didn't say that I just literally belched all of the information I've just learned and you've taken it in a way that you can't take on that information right now so you'll push it out so then we create confrontation between two people and because we don't know how to communicate our sharing of ideas and our receiving of information or our, our capacity of learning without like with keeping our mouths shut it's difficult you can't you can't get past there so because we were never taught how to communicate i think that's one of the biggest reasons that we're having a problem in this society at the moment because we don't know how to talk to each other with respect. I, yeah i mean i love that you say that because that's essentially a huge chunk of what the intention is here to convey ideas that mean you're willing to learn and not just put off by it and your back doesn't go up straight away. Yeah. Um, is it the Joe Rogan thing that we were talking about, the, the new podcast that was out the other day? Yes. Yeah. So just to give you an idea of this, I won't you mention can say, any we names. Can say, you can say which one, I don't Oh, no, no, I was just going to say, oh, there's a scenario around it. So right. I watched this podcast, obviously, massive fan of Joe Rogan. Not everything he says is amazing, but a lot of it I'm like, I, I buy into that. Mm-hmm. And obviously he recently had the Alex Jones podcast with him and Tim, Tim Dillon. Three amazing characters for various reasons. For people who don't know, by the way, Alex Jones is like a massive conspiracy theorist. Massive, theorist. yeah, he's like the king. And he's considered, a, uh, so he said some quite atrocious stuff that yeah. people really hate, but then he has mm-hmm. uncovered some truths as well. Yeah, he's a mix of both. He can take you down a rabbit hole that you don't want to go on and prove it, and then he can say something completely wacky that you would, you just, whatever. He's like the American David Icke yeah. for us in the UK. And although I love David Icke in, in many ways, I think he's very good at what he does. Um, this podcast is three hours, 20 minutes or something like that. It's a long one. And I'm aware that it's a lot of time. It's like someone's whole morning if they've got up late. So not everyone's going to watch it. So I send it out knowing that the information in that podcast is game changing and it's worth listening to, regardless of where it comes from and what you might think of those three characters in there. The information is interesting for now. So I listen with the intent to learn. I don't scream at the TV being like, you're a dick, you don't know, I know this. That, I'm not interested in that. I want to learn, so I keep my mouth shut. And I learned that a long time ago. You learn way more if you're not judging the information. I sent that podcast to 20 of my friends. Probably 25. Oh, nice, we're friends already. <laughs> but people who I think... She sent it to me, I sent guys. it to him. But people who I'm thinking... Because I felt like you would get it. You know, yeah. like people... You can't send it to everyone. You can't mm. send it to half of people in my phone book because it's just not even worth the time but I sent it to 20 of my friends that at some point have connected with me and I thought this is going out so I sent it to one of my friends and um, they watched 20 minutes of it and the response I got was like do you actually believe in this stuff this guy's crazy I can't even take it seriously just watch 20 minutes da, 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 da. that's not the point though is it yeah so usually like if I'm in front of them, I can explain myself better, but I wasn't. I was on my phone. So I had only had the voice note situation. And I found it really hard to go, oh, okay, just relax, because I know that you're going to get so much from this podcast because it's gonna. she wants to know more. So I'm like, I've given it to you for that reason because I know you want to learn, but I'm not going to patronise you and tell you that you don't know anything. Just absorb it yourself. She didn't absorb it. So I'm like, I'm not taking offence to it because that's how she dealt with it. But rather than just going, okay, cool, done, I thought this is an, a awkward, this is an awkward conversation. So I went back to her and I said, I would have hoped, in all honesty, that you would have listened with the intent to learn, not judge this person for what you think you know about this subject already, because mm. she's part into climate change. And you yeah, mentioned preconceived a lot. ideas. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I said, I would love it if you'd spend the time to watch it, 
and you watch the whole thing because it's really important and Joe Rogan actually fact checks a lot of the information that's coming out of this guy's mouth and it's mm. important to watch how he does that because this is how we kind of do need to communicate in a way about this stuff. Not thoroughly, but there's ways of doing it and I think you'll benefit from it. So she watches it and when she got back to me with the voice note, she's like, oh my God, I spent three and a half hours watching that and I was just like, I'm so glad that she did and she listened to me. She goes, do you know what? I actually, you know, I'm glad that I watched it. Thank you, you know, and I shouldn't have judged the And more the for the... the, the the learning factor, which which connects to the communication bit you're talking about, yeah. essentially just almost you're not being overzealous, but you're saying if you can consider, sit yeah. down and, and, and listen and to this. She's a really intelligent girl, you know. She's yeah. into yoga. She's a, like she's so on it, and she's her life is about sound and presence and doing more for herself. So she's the ideal person, you know, for me to share this information and have a normal chat. Mm. So I send her this voice note, thinking, oh, I don't want to piss her off. I don't want her to feel like oh, she's forcing it on me. But she listened to it. And she came back and we had a great discussion. I can't do that with everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because people will be like, who are you to tell me to waste three hours? I'm like, I'm not telling you. I'm asking you. If you want to watch it, it's there. And I'm asking you if you have. Well, it's the willingness and openness in the first place. Yeah. It's half half the battle. Yeah. And we don't have that ability to to communicate properly because we've never been taught. I, I had to teach myself how to do this out of making loads of mistakes on not how to do it. Nobody was going, you need to do this. And we did. I fucked up million times and and forced my information into people's faces when they didn't want to know now i deliver it on a cushion i'm like yeah you know off i go or i'll drop things and then they'll come back to me and they'll be like if you got any more information on that and i'm like hell yeah so then i'll send them a whole floodgate of stuff but it's i know i can't deliver this stuff to everyone because not everyone's ready to hear it doesn't mean it's not true you think do you think people who are more conventionally educated block it out quicker the reason why i ask that is because i do see see a lot of people who are you know more self-educated to really have that yeah. openness from straight away whereas mm-hmm. and I, 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 it's, it is maybe a bit of a brush statement but it does seem to be apparent a bit there's many answers for that i'll try and keep it concise um a lot of people learn it's like an echo chamber of what they think they already know they follow and a lot of people will don't want to be challenged on information because some of them have paid for their education they've paid a lot of money for that education so if you're now going well actually fundamentally the core of that is bullshit what does that mean for their degree that they're holding their life up on it can be very traumatizing to have to let go of parts of your identity to take on new information especially if you don't know it we're scared of the unknown i think people people find it it's almost sacrosanct what they're saying what they've learned yeah and it's you know especially our, our educational systems i mean these are the very same educational systems that thought that algebra would be a key subject for us all to know. Have you used your algebra? I can't say I have. Right? And <laughs> I don't know, I've not met one person yet who has used their algebra. And this is a key thing, and it still exists today. And if that doesn't show you what's wrong with the system, just by that simple comparison, I don't know what will. And this information, okay, so we live in a world of information. It's impossible for you to know everything. Mm-hmm. Possible. So if I said, you know, um, this is a certain fact about a certain president, you'd be like, really? Oh, wow. Okay, well, I'd not seen that. So there'd be an element of disbelief. You might believe me because I'm your mate, or you might believe I'm upgrading myself to to be your friend. What makes that? Yeah, there you go. Uh, But you might believe me because I'm your friend, or I might be trusted source of information for other subjects. So you might just go, oh, she'll probably be right. So you might believe me. But if there's any doubt, in you then you'll be like oh that's not what i read so you're already in comparison and when you do that there becomes this confrontation so it's the knowledge of communication and how to go past that point which is really important now if you're very well read and you think what you know is fact you're not willing to learn anything new you think you are because you think you're willing to read more books and you think you're willing to but you might be willing to learn more things but are you willing to change your opinion i'm not fixed on anything like anything, like life changes all the time. And I'm open to it changing all the time. And my identity is not destabilized by the opinions that I have or the information that I read because I feel like I know who I am because I've got rid of most of the crap that didn't serve me. So whether I learn whether, I don't know, Trump's the nicest guy on the planet or whether he's a complete dick, I don't care whether I learn. I mean, I don't believe that the world is flat, but there's people out there who are convinced that the earth is flat. If it's a shape of a pyramid tea bag, couldn't give a shit. I don't mind. And I don't put my entire life based on a slice of knowledge. Some people hold on to their education so tight 
And because of that, they are limited on the information that they can take in. They're not going to grow beyond that capacity. They're going to grow in what they want to learn and what they focus on. But also if you're telling someone, like if you start having a conversation with someone about a new paradigm shift and the nature of reality and how everything we know is a lie and the government are lying to us, most people are going to run in another direction because that's too big a thought. You know, if you're doing in a calculation that you can't do, you, I'm done with that maths, get the calculator out. Most people are like, I can't deal with the information, I can't compute it, I'm going to get the phone out. And they're just going to go and look at something else or make their life easier. What we're talking about in today's world is so deep and it's so awkward and the conversations are so high level with a lot of people. And this is one of the things that I feel that I, I do quite well on is that I can make the most complex subjects as simple as they could be well, taken. So I think you can break it down quite in, into chunks. Yeah. Which is and, clear, you, you know what you're doing on that front. And it's like I can draw on things that are relevant to you as opposed to another person. So I can make this really complex information sound quite simple to absorb because it is at the end of the day. But if you can't communicate effectively, it could be lost on someone. And this is what a lot of people, I mean, I love Russell Brand. I think he's really cool at what he's done. I don't agree with everything he's ever done. But somebody might not agree with half the shit I've done. That's fine. But when he talks, he talks so intellectually and so fast. Mm. It's like, not, and I'm not judging people. Most people's attention span are here and their information is, is not limited, but it's like they're not up there. He can go way over. He's also self-taught, interestingly. Yeah, yeah. But, and, and because he's got a passion for it, so he loves it and he, he'll learn even more at a quicker speed because of what he loves. And that goes over most people's heads, but what he's saying quite often, more often than not, it's fundamentally important for most people, but they don't compute it, they can't understand it. So, or they'll just judge him for being an ex-heroin addict because it's our judgments that stop us from learning. So for example, if you went to, you know, I, I studied something at Cambridge, right? And I didn't go to Cambridge University for the whole time. I did a course on it at Cambridge and it was an online course and I learned something. Now you might see that and be like, oh my God, she studied at Cambridge. And you might be like, oh, right, okay. So you've got this idea of me studying at Cambridge and it being amazing where actually you know I'm not highly educated I'm self-educated on mm. things that interest me but you might not have a conversation with me because you put me up on a pedestal and also you might judge me so if you've studied at Oxford and you think that's better than Cambridge or if I've just you just take my course at Cambridge and you put it out you'll think that you're better than me because you've learned something at a more prestige place and it's your ego that's attached to the academic system that you've actually paid for that gives you your entire sense of yourself. So, so, so that's d leading back to the point of conventional education as yeah. opposed to self-taught. That's, exactly. That's how you feel. And it's, you know, whatever this information is, people say don't shoot the messenger. There's two things that happen is that we shoot the messengers all the time and we judge them for everything. We judge them for that sentence on their whole life, which is stupid. And then we also chuck the baby out with the bathwater. So if they said something that doesn't quite match up, the rest of the story must be bullshit. Yeah, and chuck that it, out it too. touched on what I was saying, saying earlier. I think people get pigeonholed so quickly now. It's, yeah. it's painful. And, and it, it's just such a lack of perception to say, oh, this person is you know, pro low taxation. It doesn't mean they don't care about people no. or anything like that. It's just that's what fits with them, they're, they're the variables that contribute to them. I, um, I was thinking when you said when you were talking about the conventional education side, I do think there seems to be this apparent nature that if you're really willing in general to go about your life in the sense, and you understand the concept of push yourself beyond your comfort zone, that tends to be the, again, it's a little bit general, but the, the personality trait that means you're willing to also be self-taught or mm -hmm. explore these potential options that are a bit beyond the, the conventional knowledge of, within the world. Um, the next question, we were talking about societal uh, concerns. Is there a particular concern you have for the youth of today as opposed to society as a whole? Yes, in the fact that they also don't get taught how to communicate, but it's the... So, so it's very much connected with the bigger picture. Yeah, um, but also it's the... They've grown up in information overload attached to a phone constantly linked up to the internet. There's no natural human state that they have ever experienced unless their parents have been or their guardians in whatever way have actually taken them out of that environment and got them into a real world scenario where there's no technology. 
And I had an intern the year before last, Kitty. Uh, she's amazing. And she came out to Ibiza to intern with me. And she's so well read and so well grounded. And then she starts to reveal, and she's very, you know, she's a young, wealthy girl, family's done well, really well educated. But her parents took them, her and her brothers and sisters, to South Africa and really made them go without their phones and do this. And it was such a difference. She had a richness to her that was so interesting and she wanted to learn because she knew that it wasn't all tech based and that just uh, you know opened my heart and I wanted to help her in as much a way as possible but you don't you, you don't know who you really are without technology mm. well what do you um what do you hope you can hope to sort of be able to ponder on on your deathbed oh, that's a great question what do I hope to ponder on? What I mean by that, do, do you, what do you hope to look back on with, 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 I, with fondness? With fondness, okay. I would love to lay on my deathbed and know that I changed the world in some way. Probably in I got people to have better conversations. I think that would be awesome if I laid there and I thought to myself, oh, wow, I actually did something. <laughs> I actually, like, started and did something. That would be great, like to get people to have better conversations, to own a talkwood and be willing to have one, that's enough, right? Because they're, they're the most powerful conversations we can have. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you completely. I, I, it, with regards to the conversation, I just think it's it's so important. Who do you idolise? I don't. Don't idolise anyone? Mm -mm. No. I think some people, you know, it's like chucking a baby out of the bathwater. Some things are great about some people. Some things are terrible. So I don't idolise someone. I idolise expressions of people and I idolise thoughts, you know, other people's thoughts and, and, and books that have changed my life and stuff like that. Um, but people, you know, when they always say never meet your heroes, it can let you down and I, and I get that. But, yeah, I don't really idolise anyone. Okay. It's the first time I've had that. Um, not that I've asked that question too many times yet, but it's it's always an interesting and one. And I don't mean that arrogantly. No, 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 I think it's I think it's a great answer, I really do. Uh, what's the one thing you can't live without? Hair. No, but I mean... <laughs> cutting that! We're cutting that! Keep that in! <laughs> I thought that was quite a profound question. No, mate, I just need air. <laughs> what? <laughs> like, what's um, your one, like, not vice, but one thing, like, you think, oh, it'd be really hard to cut that out? And all it could be, all it could be, like, what's the one person or one particular quality one particular thing you need within your day or um, visually or whatever it could be music music yeah music yeah like yeah any form of music you need i need to be emotionally stimulated in that way you know and it's for me it's the core of every of everyone's got their own music their own vibe so i don't think i could live without music i oh. tried it in silence and it was great but you know music fills in the gaps favorite movie so I've got two. Go on. One, just because I really liked it when I was a kid, but now I watch it back, I'm a little bit freaked out that I liked it, which is The Labyrinth, which is David Bowie's The Labyrinth, just because it was weird and wonderful and a bit crazy. Um, and I like that kind of weird stuff. Um, and then the other one has just gone out of my head. Uh, no, it's not coming back. I can't remember it. Okay, in the meantime, favourite book? Oh, that's easy. Um, the Conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh, game changer. Big for you, obviously, personally. <sighs> Big for everyone I've ever given it to. I bought this and like handed it to people and said, you need to read this. Um, it just changed my entire perspective on what I thought God was, image and, you know, and faith and humanity and religion and everything. And I, it, it just covers every subject. And I just thought, wow, we have totally got religion wrong. Like, totally. And it made me feel happier and gave me, it gave me a certain level of faith, um, which was for me really what I needed at the time. Okay. All right, final question. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're in a world where people are scared to be happy? We're in a world where people are scared to be the greatest versions of themselves. Why? Because it's the unknown. And who are they to think that they really are that great? That's what they think. It's like, who am I to know all this? Or who am I to do this? It's, they're scared of being judged because we constantly judge people. But if you become the best version of yourself, you know, you end up being very happy because you're constantly wanting to improve and you're constantly wanting to grow. 
But if you don't allow yourself to get there, you will never be happy, unfortunately. Well, that was a pretty amazing answer, wasn't it? Um, okay, brilliant. Thank that was you. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Hey. Thank you for sharing your story and the sobriety thing in particular, Shane. That was, that was unbelievable. Um, so, yeah, we're good. Combining, colliding, another episode, Babylonian Media Productions. Fantastic. Yay.